European Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen said Sunday the world was in a race against time to understand the new COVID variant and, if needed, modify vaccines to counter it. We know we are now in a race against time, von der Leyen said during a visit to Riga, calling for the public to take precautions to give scientists time to understand the Omicron strain. The scientists and manufacturers need two to three weeks to have a full picture about the quality of the mutations of this Omicron variant, she said. We need to buy time, she added, urging people to vaccinate, wear masks and practice social distancing. She said that a contract struck in the summer by the European Commission with BioNTech Pfizer for 1.8 billion vaccine doses included a clause in case of an escape variant, a strain that can evade vaccine immunity. A clause in the contract states that if a variant turns into an escape variant, BioNTech Pfizer is able to adapt its vaccine within 100 days, she said. The new, heavily mutated COVID-19 variant has spread across the globe, shutting borders, renewing curbs and sparking fears for the fight against the nearly two-year-old coronavirus pandemic. China's CO2 emissions fell in the third quarter for the first time since the country reopened from COVID-19 lockdowns, research published Thursday showed, in what experts said could mark a carbon, turning point, for the country. But the threat of economic slowdown could soon prompt authorities to turn to infrastructure stimulus measures, raising emissions again, the research by the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, CRE, warned. The world's second biggest economy has vowed to peak emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality by 2060, but authorities have struggled to wean the country off its dependence on fossil fuels. China's emissions fell dramatically in early 2020 due to sweeping quarantines aimed at curbing the coronavirus, then rebounded to higher than 2019 monthly levels as cities and factories reopened. But in the third quarter of this year, the country recorded a 0.5% year-on-year decline in emissions from fossil fuels and cement, the first quarterly fall since the post-lockdown rebound, Cree analyst Lori Milaverda found. The decline was caused by a construction slump after Beijing cracked down on speculation and debt in the real estate sector, as well as high coal prices that resulted in power rationing across the country, Milaverda said. The drop in emissions could mark a turning point and an early peak in China's emissions total, years ahead of its target to peak before 2030, Milaverda said in his report. But he warned that, if the Chinese government injects further construction stimulus to boost its economy, emissions could rebound once again, before peaking later this decade. While the coal crisis was caused by ballooning coal consumption and price control policies, the perception within the country that the transition to cleaner energy was to blame could make Beijing hesitant to strengthen climate targets until the coal crisis is fully resolved, Milaverda added. The recent COP26 climate summit pushed China's climate commitments into the spotlight, with critics accusing the world's biggest polluter of not being ambitious enough in its emissions targets. The communist leadership also faces domestic pressure to ward off economic slowdown, making authorities reluctant to pin down specific emissions-cutting measures. Earlier this month, parts of the country's north saw heavy pollution after China said it had increased daily coal production by more than 1 million tons to ease the energy shortage. While PCR tests can detect infection with Omicron, studies are looking to whether the COVID-19 variant of concern has any impact on other test types, the WHO said Sunday. The widely used PCR tests continue to detect infection, including infection with Omicron, as we have seen with other variants, the World Health Organization said in an update on what is known so far about the new variant. Studies are ongoing to determine whether there is any impact on other types of tests, including rapid antigen detection tests. The WHO on Friday declared Omicron, first detected earlier this month in southern Africa, to be a variant of concern. The classification put Omicron into the most troubling category of COVID-19 variants, along with the globally dominant Delta, and its weaker rivals Alpha, Beta and Gamma. Omicron spread across the globe on Sunday, shutting borders and renewing curbs as the EU chief said governments faced a race against time to understand the strain. The variant has cast doubt on global efforts to battle the pandemic due to fears that it is highly infectious, forcing countries to reimpose measures many had hoped were a thing of the past. In its update, the WHO said it was not yet clear whether Omicron spreads more easily from person to person, or whether infection with the variant causes more severe disease compared to other strains.
There is currently no information to suggest that symptoms associated with Omicron are different from those from other variants, the UN Health Agency said. While preliminary evidence suggests there may be an increased risk of people who previously had COVID being reinfected with Omicron, information is currently limited. The WHO said it was working to understand the potential impact of the variant on existing countermeasures, including vaccines. As for treatments, the organization said corticosteroids and IL-6 receptor blockers would still be effective for managing patients with severe COVID-19, while other treatments would be assessed to see if they are still as effective against Omicron. The WHO has said studies into various aspects of the new variant would take several weeks to reach conclusions. WHO is coordinating with a large number of researchers around the world to better understand Omicron, it said. More information will emerge in the coming days and weeks. The new COVID variant Omicron has many more mutations than the Delta variant, according to a first image of this new variant initially detected in South Africa, produced and published by the prestigious Bambino Jesu Hospital in Rome. On the three-dimensional image, which looks like a map, we can clearly see that the Omicron variant presents many more mutations than the Delta variant, concentrated above all in one area of the protein that interacts with human cells, the team of researchers said in a statement Sunday. This does not automatically mean that these variations are more dangerous, just that the virus has further adapted to the human species by generating another variant, the researchers said. Other studies will tell us if this adaptation is neutral, less dangerous or more dangerous, they added. The research team focused on the search for mutations in the three-dimensional structure of the spike protein, Claudia Altieri, professor of clinical microbiology at Milan State University and a researcher at Bambino Gesù, told AFP. The image was produced from the study of the sequences of this new variant made available to the scientific community, coming mainly from Botswana, South Africa and Hong Kong. This image, which represents a map of all the variations, describes the mutations of Omicron but does not define its role, she said. It will now be important to define through laboratory experiments whether the combination of these mutations can have an impact on transmission or on the effectiveness of vaccines, for example, she added. The head of the World Health Organization in Africa on Sunday urged countries to follow the science rather than imposing flight bans in a bid to contain the new Omicron coronavirus variant. With the Omicron variant now detected in several regions of the world, putting in place travel bans that target Africa attacks global solidarity, said WHO Regional Director General Matshidiso Moati. Travel restrictions may play a role in slightly reducing the spread of COVID-19 but place a heavy burden on lives and livelihoods, the WHO said in a statement. If restrictions are implemented, they should not be unnecessarily invasive or intrusive, and should be scientifically based, the UN body said. The Omicron strain has cast doubt on global efforts to battle the coronavirus pandemic because of fears that it is highly infectious, forcing countries to reimpose measures many had hoped were a thing of the past. As scientists race to determine the level of threat posed by the new strain, particularly whether it can evade existing vaccines, a South African doctor said dozens of her patients suspected of Omicron infection had shown only mild symptoms such as fatigue. A long list of countries has already imposed travel restrictions on southern Africa, including key travel hub Qatar, the US, Britain, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and the Netherlands. Australia will review its plans to reopen borders to skilled migrants and students from December 1, Prime Minister Scott Morrison said on Monday after the country reported its first cases of the Omicron coronavirus variant over the weekend. Two people who arrived in Australia from southern Africa tested positive on Sunday for the newly identified Omicron variant as officials ordered 14-day quarantines for citizens returning from nine African countries and banned entry from those nations for non-citizens. Morrison urged people to remain calm, saying data has not yet fully proven the severity, transmissibility and vaccine resistance of the Omicron strain. So we just take this one step at a time, get the best information, make calm, sensible decisions, Morrison told Nine News on Monday, adding, it is a bit too early, to reinstate the two-week mandatory hotel quarantine rule for foreign travelers. Omicron dubbed a variant of concern, by the World Health Organization, is potentially more contagious than previous variants. 
Experts do not know yet if it will cause more or less severe COVID-19 compared to other strains. Sydney and Melbourne, Australia's largest cities, had begun to allow fully vaccinated citizens entry without quarantine from November 1 after shutting their borders for more than 18 months. Both cities have tightened their border rules with all international travelers ordered to quarantine for 72 hours. Other states have not opened their borders to foreign travelers yet due to varying vaccination rates. Morrison said the National Security Committee will meet later on Monday to assess the government's border reopening relaxations due from Wednesday. A meeting of leaders of all states and territories will be held by Tuesday, he said. Strict border controls and snap lockdowns have helped Australia to keep its coronavirus numbers far lower than many comparable countries. It has so far recorded about 208,000 cases and 1,994 deaths since the pandemic began. The coronavirus pandemic will cost the global tourism sector US$2 trillion in lost revenue in 2021, the UN's tourism body said Monday, calling the sector's recovery, fragile, and slow. The forecast from the Madrid-based World Tourism Organization comes as Europe is grappling with a surge in infections and as a new heavily mutated COVID-19 variant, dubbed Omicron, spreads across the globe. International tourist arrivals will this year remain 70 to 75 percent below the 1.5 billion arrivals recorded in 2019 before the pandemic hit, a similar decline as in 2020, according to the body. The global tourism sector already lost US$2 trillion in revenues last year due to the pandemic, according to the UNWTO, making it one of sectors hit hardest by the health crisis. While the UN body charged with promoting tourism does not have an estimate for how the sector will perform next year, its medium-term outlook is not encouraging. Despite the recent improvements, uneven vaccination rates around the world and new COVID-19 strains, such as the Delta variant and Omicron, could impact the already slow and fragile recovery, it said in a statement. The introduction of fresh virus restrictions and lockdowns in several nations in recent weeks shows how, it's a very unpredictable situation, UNWTO head Zurb Palalikashvili told AFP. It's a historical crisis in the tourism industry but again tourism has the power to recover quite fast, he added ahead of the start of the WTO's annual General Assembly in Madrid on Tuesday. I really hope that 2022 will be much better than 2021. While international tourism has taken a hit from the outbreak of disease in the past, the coronavirus is unprecedented in its geographical spread. In addition to virus-related travel restrictions, the sector is also grappling with the economic strain caused by the pandemic, the spike in oil's prices and the disruption of supply chains, the UNWTO said. Palalikashvili urged nations to harmonize their virus protocols and restrictions because tourists are confused and they don't know how to travel. International tourist arrivals rebounded during the summer season in the Northern Hemisphere thanks to increased travel confidence, rapid vaccination and the easing of entry restrictions in many nations, the UNWTO said. Despite the improvement in the third quarter, the pace of recovery remains uneven across world regions due to varying degrees of mobility restrictions, vaccination rates and traveler confidence, it added. Arrivals in some islands in the Caribbean and South Asia, and well as some destinations in Southern Europe, came close to or sometimes exceeded pre-pandemic levels in the third quarter. Other countries however hardly saw any tourists at all, particularly in Asia and the Pacific, where arrivals were down 95% compared to 2019 as many destinations remained closed to non-essential travel. A total of 46 destinations, 21% of all destinations worldwide, currently have their borders completely closed to tourists, according to the UNWTO. A further 55 have their borders partially closed to foreign visitors, while just four nations have lifted all virus-related restrictions, Colombia, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic and Mexico. The future of the travel sector will be in focus at the WTO Annual General Assembly, which will run until Friday. The event, which brings together representatives from 159 member states of the UN body, was originally scheduled to be held in Marrakesh. But Morocco in late October decided not to host the event due to the rise in COVID-19 cases in many countries. Before the pandemic, the tourism sector accounted for about 10% of the world's gross domestic product and jobs. Britain and Israel will work night and day in preventing Iran from becoming a nuclear power, 
the foreign ministers of the two countries wrote in a joint article. The clock is ticking, which heightens the need for close cooperation with our partners and friends to thwart Tehran's ambitions, the UK's Liz Truss and her Israeli counterpart Yair Lapid wrote in the Telegraph newspaper on Sunday. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett said earlier in the day that his country was very worried that world powers will remove sanctions on Iran in exchange for insufficient caps on its nuclear program, as negotiators convene in Vienna on Monday in a last-ditch effort to salvage a nuclear deal. Meanwhile, Israel and Britain will sign a 10-year agreement on Monday to work closely on areas such as cybersecurity, technology, trade and defense, according to The Telegraph. The foreign ministers added in the article that Israel will officially become Britain's tier one cyber partner in a bid to improve its cyber defenses as countries around the world face increased threats. Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro on Sunday denounced members of the EU's electoral observation mission who monitored voting last weekend as spies and accused them of looking to stain the regional elections on their preliminary report. Local and regional elections enjoyed better conditions than during previous voting, the EU mission said on Tuesday, though they raised concerns about arbitrary bans on candidates for administrative reasons, delays in opening voting centers and extended use of state resources in the campaign. They looked to stain the electoral process in a report and they couldn't. A delegation of spies, they weren't observers, wandered freely around the country, spying on the country's social, economic and political life, Maduro said during a broadcast on state television. The mission did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Voting last weekend was the first time in 15 years that the EU sent a mission to observe Venezuelan elections. The team included 1,000 observers who monitored voting in 22 out of 23 elections and the full report will be presented in two months. In this election, opposition politicians contested votes for the first time since 2017. However, they were roundly beaten, picking up just three out of 23 governorships and 117 mayoral positions, with the ruling party winning 210 mayoral races. Several mayoral races had yet to be called, and one governor's office, in Barinas state, a Chavismo stronghold, has not been called either. The EU couldn't stain the electoral process, it was impeccable, beautiful, Maduro said. The president will hold meetings in, the coming hours, with opposition governors, he said, without giving further details. He also suggested the ruling socialists could have lost in a few states and municipalities due to voters punishing the party at the polls. While the ruling party picked up the most governorships, votes for the socialists dwindled to fewer than 4 million, according to figures from the country's electoral authority, down from the 5.9 million it won during regional elections in 2017. The top U.S. infectious disease official, Dr. Anthony Fauci, told President Joe Biden on Sunday it will take about two weeks to have definitive information on the new coronavirus variant Omicron that has sparked new travel restrictions and shaken financial markets. Biden, returning to Washington following the Thanksgiving holiday weekend, was briefed in person by his coronavirus response team on Sunday afternoon as officials expect the new variant to reach the U.S. despite an impending ban on travelers from southern Africa, where it was first detected. Fauci said he believes existing vaccines are likely to provide a degree of protection against severe cases of COVID, and officials reiterated their recommendation for vaccinated Americans to get booster shots, according to a readout of the briefing. Biden was due to update the public on the new variant and the U.S. response on Monday, the White House said. Omicron, which was first detected in southern Africa, has now been confirmed in Australia, Belgium, Botswana, Britain, Denmark, Germany, Hong Kong, Israel, Italy, the Netherlands, France, South Africa, and the U.S., neighbor to the north, Canada. Earlier on Sunday, Fauci told ABC News, this week, that the new variant would, inevitably, reach the U.S. U.S. health officials were to speak with counterparts in South Africa to get more information in real time, Fauci told NBC, adding the flight curves would give them more time to gather information and weigh possible action. It clearly is giving indication that it has the capability of transmitting rapidly. That's the thing that's causing us now to be concerned, he added on NBC. Its appearance in the U.S., where 30% of the population has not received a single dose of vaccine, 
could threaten to undermine the nation's recovery nearly two years after COVID-19's emergence and further pressure local health care systems already taxed by the recent Delta variant. Rising cases as colder weather forces more people indoors has also caused some hospital systems in U.S. states, including New York, to declare emergencies. So far, nearly 782,000 people have died in the U.S. from COVID-19 since early 2020, the most of any country in the world, amid over 48 million infections, Reuters data show. The U.S. is joining other nations in seeking to block transmission by imposing travel restrictions. Beginning at 12.01 a.m. on Monday, it will bar entry of nearly all foreign nationals who have been in any of eight Southern African countries within the last 14 days and has warned Americans against traveling to those nations. U.S. citizens and lawful U.S. permanent residents who have traveled to the countries will still be able to enter the U.S. and no new screening or tracing requirements have been introduced. Flights by Delta Air Lines and United Airlines have continued from South Africa to the United States since the variant was discovered. Fauci and other top officials said the sudden burst of cases made Omicron worrisome and it remained unclear how current vaccines or therapeutics could be impacted. We need more data there before we can say confidently that this is not a severe version of the virus, but we should find that out in the next couple weeks, outgoing National Institutes of Health Director Dr. Francis Collins told, Fox News Sunday. Vaccine makers Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna have said they expect more information soon. We have to go through a couple of weeks yet of uncertainty, Moderna Chief Medical Officer Dr. Paul Burden told CNN, saying Omicron's transmissibility and severity were also still unknown along with current vaccine's effectiveness against it. Fauci pressed Americans to continue to get COVID-19 vaccines and boosters while experts evaluate Omicron. This is a clarion call to get vaccinated, he told NBC. The U.S. has recorded over 1.1 million new COVID-19 cases in the last 14 days, up 9% from the prior two weeks, Reuters data shows, with Michigan and Minnesota leading the nation in new cases, based on infections per 100,000 residents. The proportion of COVID-19 tests coming back positive in New York State had doubled since last month to 4.23%, underscoring the need for vaccinations, Governor Kathy Hochul said in a statement. Cases are rising throughout New York State, and the new Omicron variant poses a very real threat to the progress we've made, Hochul said. The variant could cast a pall over the rest of the U.S. holiday season and potentially impact companies' return to office plans. Dutch border police said Sunday they arrested a couple on a plane after they fled a quarantine hotel where COVID-positive passengers from South African flights were staying. The drama came after Dutch authorities said that 61 people who arrived on two flights at Amsterdam's Schiphol Airport on Friday had tested positive for the coronavirus, 13 of them with the new Omicron variant. One of the members of the couple had tested positive for COVID-19 and went into isolation, while the other person was negative but in quarantine, according to Public Health Authority spokeswoman Stephanie Van Wardenberg. She added that both were back in isolation, but not at the same hotel. They are a Spanish man. 30 and a Portuguese woman, aged 28, police spokesman Stan Berbert told AFP. The Royal Netherlands Marekousi at Schiphol has arrested a couple this evening who had fled from a quarantine hotel, Berbert said. The arrests took place in a plane that was about to take off. They were on a plane that was about to depart for Spain at around 6 p.m., he added. Border police are now laying charges with the Dutch Public Prosecutor's Office against the couple for jeopardizing public safety, he said. The pair had been handed over to the public health authority, Berbert confirmed. It was not known how the couple left the hotel or how the alarm was raised. The Dutch authorities announced stricter new travel protocols on Friday as alarm mounted around the world about the new Omicron variant, which first emerged in southern Africa. The 600 people on the two South Africa flights on Friday spent most of the day stuck at the airport being tested in conditions that one person described as, dystopia central. Dutch Health Minister Hugo de Jong had said just hours earlier that authorities in the Netherlands would ensure that people obeyed quarantine rules. The COVID-positive passengers from the South Africa flights are almost all at the hotel while a handful has been allowed to go into home quarantine. Passengers who tested negative have also been ordered into home quarantine. We will control whether they keep to those rules, de Jong told reporters.
The health minister added that it could not be excluded that more people than the initial 13 had contracted the Omicron variant. We are concerned, but how much we should be at this stage we don't know yet, De Jong said. Police and security guards were on guard at the quarantine hotel, a spokeswoman for the local mayor said earlier. The security is there for a reason, the spokeswoman said. Fiji will deploy 50 troops to an Australian-led peacekeeping force in the Solomon Islands following anti-government rioting that raised parts of the capital Honiara, Prime Minister Frank Bainamarama said Monday. The Fijian contingent will lift the number of peacekeepers to about 200 troops and police officers, mostly Australian with a contribution of at least 34 personnel from Papua New Guinea. Out of concern for the safety and well-being of our Pacific sisters and brothers in the Solomon Islands, 50 Fijian troops will dispatch to Honiara tomorrow as part of reinforced platoon embedded with Australian force elements to help maintain peace and security, the Fijian leader tweeted. The Solomon's crisis erupted last week with three days of deadly rioting in Honiara blamed partly on poverty, hunger and frustration with government policies in the Pacific Island nation of 800,000. During the riots, which claimed at least three lives, mobs attempted to torch the Prime Minister's private residence and parliament before being dispersed by police firing tear gas and warning shots. The Fiji deployment comes as Honiara residents continue to clean up the shattered capital, where much of the Chinatown area was reduced to smoldering rubble. A resurgence of COVID-19 infections in northern China have forced two small cities to suspend public transport and tighten control over residents' movement, as the country has shown no willingness to go easy on local outbreaks. China reported 21 new locally transmitted COVID-19 cases with confirmed symptoms on Sunday, official data showed on Monday, marking the highest daily count since mid-November. Almost all of the new local cases were detected in the northern Chinese region of Inner Mongolia. The latest cases came shortly after a few other northern cities, hit hard in China's biggest Delta outbreak, which started mid-October, had contained their clusters this month and gradually lifted curbs, indicating it has become harder for China to stay clear of local flare-ups. The new resurgence is tiny relative to many outbreaks overseas, and national officials specified that China does not aim for remaining at zero cases. However, Beijing still requires officials to stay on high vigilance to be ready to quickly quash local outbreaks, meaning some tough curbs are likely to be imposed when new cases emerge. In the inner Mongolian city of Manjoli, a crucial port of entry that borders Russia and has about 150,000 residents, reported 20 local symptomatic cases on November 28. Over the weekend, Manjoli banned residents from leaving town and suspended public transport as well as certain non-urgent services at hospitals. It also closed marketplaces and entertainment venues, halted dining in restaurants, in-person school classes and religious gatherings, and started a second round of citywide testing. Haler District, an administrative division about three hours away from Manjoli, has blocked some roads linking it to the outside and required people arriving from Manjoli to be quarantined at centralized facilities for two weeks. Neha, a city of about 440,000 in the northeastern Heilongjiang province, reported on Sunday one locally transmitted asymptomatic carrier, which China counts separately from confirmed patients. Neha has tightened controls over residents' movement, shut down non-essential businesses, and cut public transport and some services at private hospitals and clinics. The cities of Suihua, Shuangyashan and Daqing, also in Heilongjiang province, have required people seeking to leave or enter to provide proof of a negative test result within 48 hours. As of November 28, mainland China had 98,672 confirmed symptomatic cases, including both local ones and those found among inbound travelers. The death toll remained at 4,636. When COVID riots rocked the Netherlands for the second time in a year, Ricardo Pronk was there to livestream it all to his followers on social media. The 50-year-old anti-vaccination activist administered a Facebook group with 10,000 followers, which had shared a call for a demonstration in the port city of Rotterdam on November 19 that later turned violent. The group, which was recently removed by Facebook, is part of a network of conspiracy theorists and COVID deniers on social media reaching as far as the Dutch parliament, whose influence has sparked concern among experts. 
For Pronk, vaccines are weapons made to kill. He also embraces the QAnon conspiracy group's narrative about satanic child abuse by a globalized elite. But the unemployed former computer technician, who had chosen a banner for the group with a lion against a backdrop of flames, rejects any responsibility for the unrest in the Netherlands. Five people were shot when police opened fire in Rotterdam, and riots spread around the country for the next three days. Violence is not the best way, of course not. The best is to do things peacefully, he told AFP. Both in January, during the Netherlands' worst riots in 40 years over a curfew, and last week's unrest, social media were used not only to organize protests but also to spread disinformation. What is unique about the Netherlands is that we have repeatedly seen COVID protests turn into riots just this year, said Kieran O'Connor, an analyst at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London, which specializes in countering radicalism. While Prime Minister Mark Rutte has branded rioters, scum, and idiots, O'Connor pointed the finger at the epidemic of conspiracy theories on the internet in the Netherlands. On Facebook alone, the top 125 groups disseminating false information about COVID-19 saw a 63% rise in followers in six months, comprising 789,000 members in this country of 17 million people, an ISD study said. Telegram groups during last week's riots were filled with plans for demonstrations, calls for riots, along with messages targeting Muslims, Jews and gay people. The social media groups usually don't call for violence but they may accept it as part of the solution, said O'Connor. The anti-vax and anti-COVID movement is creating a space allowing for other forces to engage and express their frustration in a violent way. Dutch authorities blamed the riots on a variety of culprits, ranging from frustrated youths to football hooligans and genuine coronavirus protesters, but they also underlined the importance of social media in organizing them. In June, Dutch intelligence services said they feared that anti-government demonstrations are a breeding ground for extremism. In a country where 85% of adults are vaccinated, the anti-vax movement is a clear minority group, said Claes de Vries, professor of political communication at the University of Amsterdam. But unlike in neighboring countries, their voice has been strongly amplified by the fact that they have found a political ally in parliament, namely the Forum for Democracy Party. The leader of this far-right group, Thierry Baudet, has largely dropped his anti-immigration rhetoric to adopt a strong anti-vaccination stance and to promote conspiracy theories. Baudet has been dubbed the Dutch Donald Trump and one of his tweets was labeled misleading by Twitter ahead of elections in March, a first for a Dutch politician. One of the party's lawmakers was reprimanded recently for threatening a fellow MP in Parliament with a tribunal if the forum came to power because of his support for the government's policies. O'Connor at ISD said that some material was slipping under the radar of the social media. Giants because it was in Dutch. Compared to the US or the UK, Twitter or Facebook don't have the same focus on gatekeeping their platforms against people who use them irresponsibly, he said. Taiwan and Europe must work together to defend against authoritarianism and disinformation, President Tsai Ing-wen told visiting lawmakers from the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia on Monday. Lithuania has faced sustained pressure from China, which claims Taiwan as its own territory, since allowing the opening of a de facto Taiwanese embassy in its capital. Beijing has ramped up military and diplomatic pressure on Taipei to accept Chinese sovereignty claims and to limit its international participation, though Tsai says Taiwan will not bow to threats and will defend its freedom and democracy. Tsai told the lawmakers at the presidential office that Taiwan and the Baltic nations, once part of the Soviet Union, share similar experiences of breaking free from authoritarian rule and of fighting for freedom. The democracy we enjoy today was hard-earned. This is something we all understand most profoundly, she said. Now the world faces challenges posed by the expansion of authoritarianism and threat of disinformation. Taiwan is more than willing to share its experience at combating disinformation with its European friends. We must safeguard our shared values to ensure our free and democratic way of life. Mattis Maldakis, leader of the Lithuanian parliament's Taiwan Friendship Group, told Tsai in response their group was in Taipei to express their solidarity with the island. Lithuanian government policy towards Taiwan has wide support in our society. Preserving freedom and the rules-based international order is in the vital interests for both Taiwan and Lithuania, he said.
There is much opportunity for economic and cultural cooperation, added Maldakis, whose trip has been condemned by China. No EU member state has official ties with Taiwan. The U.S. has strongly backed its NATO ally Lithuania in its spat with China. Lithuania faces problems too with pressure from Russia and Belarus, with migrants on its border with Belarus. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said on Monday the country will move into a system of living with the COVID-19 virus later this week despite the new Omicron variant posing a fresh health threat to the world. There were no cases of the Omicron variant in New Zealand at this stage but the developing global situation showed why a cautious approach was needed at the borders, she said. Omicron is a reminder of the risk that still exists at our borders, Ardern said at the news conference. New Zealand has some of the toughest border controls in the world and plans to keep borders closed to most international travelers for a further five months. It also introduced fresh border measures for travelers from nine southern African nations on the weekend, announcing that only citizens from these countries can travel to New Zealand and will have to stay in state quarantine for 14 days. Ardern said a lot of evidence still needed to be gathered to know the impact of the Omicron variant. It may impact on our vaccines, but it may not. It may be more severe or it may be more mild than Delta. We simply don't know, Ardern said. Director General of Health Ashley Bloomfield said authorities were looking at whether more needed to be done at the borders to keep Omicron away. It's really just looking to keep it Omicron out while we learn more about it, Bloomfield told reporters at the news conference. New Zealand moves into a new, traffic light, system from Friday that rates regions as red, orange or green depending on their level of exposure to COVID-19 and vaccination rates. Auckland, the epicenter of the country's Delta outbreak, will start at red, making face masks mandatory and putting limits on gatherings at public places. New Zealand has had about 11,000 cases so far and 43 related deaths. South Africa's daily COVID-19 infection rate could triple to more than 10,000 by the end of this week as the new Omicron variant spreads rapidly, an infectious disease expert said on Monday. Professor Salim Abdul Karim, the government's chief advisor during the initial response to the pandemic, also said that, while existing vaccines should be effective at preventing severe disease from the variant, South African hospitals could be under pressure from a flood of admissions within two to three weeks. Even if Omicron is not clinically worse, and certainly the anecdotes don't raise any red flags just yet, we are going to see this pressure on hospitals, in all likelihood because of the rapidity of transmission, he told a news conference. The discovery of the variant in Southern Africa has caused global alarm with countries limiting travel from the region and imposing other restrictions for fear it could spread quickly even in vaccinated populations. The World Health Organization said on Monday that the variant posed a very high global risk of infection surges, though further research was needed to assess its potential to evade protection against immunity induced by vaccines and previous infections. Abdul Karim, a professor at South Africa's University of KwaZulu-Natal and Columbia University in the U.S., said vaccines were still likely to confer good protection against Omicron because of T-cell immunity, different from the antibody immunity that often blocks infections. Even if there's some escape from antibodies it's very hard to escape T-cell immunity, he said. Doctors who have treated South African COVID-19 patients say Omicron so far appears to be producing mild symptoms, including a dry cough, fever and night sweats. But public health experts say it is too early to draw firm conclusions. The government says it is doing everything possible to prepare health facilities to cope with the variant and is asking countries that impose travel restrictions on southern Africa to reverse them, Health Minister Joe Fala told the same news conference. So far, there has not been a steep increase in hospital admissions or COVID-19 deaths since the variant was first detected in South Africa last week, in samples from earlier in November. On Sunday, the National Institute for Communicable Diseases reported 2,858 new cases, down from 3,220 on Saturday but compared to roughly 302 weeks ago when the country, where around 35% of adults have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, was experiencing a lull after a third wave of infections. South Africa has confirmed close to 3 million COVID-19 infections in total during the pandemic and over 89,000 deaths, the most on the African continent. President Cyril Ramaphosa said on Sunday that authorities were considering making vaccination compulsory for certain places and activities, 
a departure from an earlier stance that it would remain voluntary. Big business came out strongly in support on Monday, with one association saying it fully endorsed the proposal and another seeking a legal opinion to help companies enforce it. Rene Muthil, head of a group representing auto component manufacturers, said his industry was supportive in principle of mandatory vaccination because lower car assembly volumes had put component makers under pressure and business continuity was important. But a lobby group mainly representing the interests of white Afrikaans speakers, descendants of predominantly Dutch settlers, wrote to Ramaphosa saying while it supported people getting immunized voluntarily, vaccine mandates were an unjustifiable violation of personal freedoms that risked a backlash. President Joe Biden urged Americans on Monday not to panic about the new COVID-19 Omicron variant and said the U.S. was making contingency plans with pharmaceutical companies if new vaccines are needed. Biden said the country would not go back to lockdowns to stop the spread of Omicron, and he would lay out his strategy on Thursday for combating the pandemic over the winter. He urged people to get vaccinated, get boosters and wear masks. This variant is a cause for concern, not a cause for panic. Biden said in remarks at the White House following a meeting with his COVID-19 team. We're going to fight and beat this new variant, he said. Omicron has prompted countries across the globe including the U.S. to limit travel from southern Africa, where the virus was first detected. The World Health Organization said Monday that it carries a very high risk of infection surges, but said no deaths had yet been linked to the new variant. Biden said it was inevitable that Omicron cases would emerge in the U.S. But White House spokesperson Jen Psaki said the variant should not cause Americans to change their holiday travel plans as long as they are vaccinated and wear masks. Biden said he believed that existing vaccines would continue to protect against severe disease, but added that his administration was working with vaccine makers Pfizer, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson to develop contingency plans. In the event, hopefully unlikely, that updated vaccinations or boosters are needed to respond to this new variant, we will accelerate their development and deployment with every available tool, he said. He said he would direct the Food and Drug Administration FDA, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention CDC, to make those vaccines available quickly. A U.S. travel ban took effect earlier on Monday blocking most visitors from eight southern African nations from entering the country. Earlier flights from South Africa to the U.S. did not screen passengers after the variant was found. The White House is not curbing Biden's travel plans or canceling its holiday parties, Pasaki said. Biden said the travel restrictions were put in place to give the country time to get more people vaccinated. Vaccine hesitancy in the U.S. and around the world has thwarted public health officials' efforts to get the pandemic under control. Only a quarter of the population in South Africa is fully vaccinated, while many Western European nations have vaccinated more than two-thirds of their residents. Just 59% of all Americans are fully vaccinated, although almost 70% now have at least one dose. Nearly 782,000 people have died from COVID-19 in the U.S., according to a Reuters tally. Much of the U.S. shut down in early 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic, but economic activity and jobs have bounced back in recent months. Face masks and vaccine mandates are opposed by some Republican politicians, even as health experts tout their effectiveness. Pfizer has already started working on a version of its COVID-19 vaccine specifically targeting the new Omicron variant in case the current inoculation is not effective against the latest strain, the U.S. drug maker's CEO Albert Borla said Monday. Borla told CNBC that his company on Friday began testing the current vaccine against the Omicron variant, which was first reported in South Africa and has reignited fears of a global wave of COVID-19 infections. I don't think the result will be the vaccines don't protect, Borla said. But the testing could show that existing shots protect less, which would mean that we need to create a new vaccine, Borla said. Friday we made our first DNA template, which is the first possible inflection of the development process of a new vaccine, he said. Johnson & Johnson also said Monday that it is pursuing an Omicron-specific variant vaccine and will progress it as needed. On Friday, Moderna, another leading COVID-19 vaccine maker, said it was developing a booster shot against the new variant. 
Borla likened the situation to the scenario earlier this year when Pfizer and its German partner BioNTech developed a vaccine in 95 days when there were concerns the previous formula would not work against Delta, though that version ultimately was not used. The current vaccine is very effective against Delta, the executive said, adding that the companies expect to be able to produce 4 billion vaccine doses in 2022. On Monday, the World Health Organization warned the new COVID-19 Omicron variant poses a very high risk globally. Borla said he was also very confident that Pfizer's recently unveiled antiviral pill would work as a treatment for infections caused by the mutations, including Omicron. Among newly infected, high-risk patients treated within three days of the onset of symptoms, Pfizer's pill has been shown to cut hospitalization or death by nearly 90%. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said Monday he was deeply concerned as countries around the world imposed travel restrictions on southern Africa in an attempt to stop the spread of a worrying new COVID-19 variant discovered there. The people of Africa cannot be blamed for the immorally low level of vaccinations available in Africa, and they should not be penalized for identifying and sharing crucial science and health information with the world, Guterres said in a statement. I am now deeply concerned about the isolation of southern African countries due to new COVID-19 travel restrictions, the UN chief said. Countries across the world have reacted to the Omicron strain by slamming their borders shut despite the variant having already reached Europe, Asia and North America. Guterres appealed to governments to instead consider alternative measures including repeated testing for travelers, to avoid the risk of transmission so as to allow for travel and economic engagement. The World Health Organization, WHO, has determined the overall risk from Omicron to be very high, but the WHO's director for Africa also spoke out against barring travelers from the continent, saying it attacks global solidarity. Officials in South Africa, where the variant was first flagged on Thursday, have said they are being punished for identifying a strain that has now been detected everywhere from the Netherlands to Britain, Canada and Hong Kong, while Malawi's president Lazarus Chakwera accused Western countries of Afrophobia. South African scientists have discovered a new COVID-19 variant with multiple mutations, Omicron, which is thought to be highly contagious. The World Health Organization warned on Monday that the Omicron variant poses a very high risk globally. Many countries are racing to try to contain it, banning flights from South Africa and neighboring countries. Scientists are also working round the clock to analyze the variant and try to understand its behavior. Here is a brief explainer of what is known so far about Omicron, days after it emerged, as shared by scientists. It is currently unclear where the variant originated, but the variant was first described in Botswana and shortly thereafter in South Africa, according to top South African epidemiologist Professor Salim Abdul Karim. South African scientists went on to announce the discovery on November 25. By that time cases had been detected in Hong Kong. Days later at least 11 countries including Israel, Belgium, the UK, Netherlands, Italy, Canada and Portugal had found infections with the variant. Scientists discovered the new variant with a very unusual constellation of mutations on November 23. Some of the mutations are already known affecting transmissibility and immune evasion, but many others are new. The WHO said Monday the strain is a highly divergent variant with a high number of mutations, some of which are concerning and may be associated with immune escape potential and higher transmissibility. It has the most mutations we have seen to date, said Professor Moza Mashabella, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He said, some of these mutations we have seen before like in Delta and Beta, but others are new to scientists and we don't know what the combination of those mutations will translate into. Leading virologist Tulio de Oliveira said there were around 50 mutations overall, including 30 on the spike protein, the focus of most vaccines as it is what enables the virus to enter cells. Official statistics show that nearly three-quarters of the COVID-19 cases reported in South Africa in recent days are driven by the new variant. Although not all are Omicron cases, the daily COVID positivity rate rose last week from 3.6% on Wednesday to 6.5% on Thursday, and by Sunday it hit 9.8%. It is forecast that actual numbers of daily infections could treble to around 10,000 by the end of this week.
Some of the mutations that are expressed have previously been shown to enable the virus to spread easily and quickly, and because of that we suspect that that new variant is going to spread quickly, said Mashabella. Some of the genetic mutations shown by the virus are known to enable the virus to evade immunity. It is still unclear what the impact will be on the protection provided by vaccines. But, based on what we know, the vaccines should hold well in terms of preventing hospitalization and severe disease because they depend on T-cell immunity and less on antibodies, said Karim. As for the severity of disease caused by the variant, scientists say there is not enough data yet. The U.S. military will reinforce deployments and bases directed at China and Russia, even while maintaining forces in the Middle East adequate to deter Iran and jihadist groups, the Pentagon said Monday based on the results of a review. The U.S. Defense Department will be upgrading and expanding military facilities in Guam and Australia, underscoring its focus on China as the country's leading defense rival, officials said. The details of the Global Posture Review commissioned at the start of the administration of President Joe Biden early this year, would remain classified, the officials said, so as not to give secrets away to rivals or to reveal confidential plans with allies. However, the review confirmed that the priority region for the U.S. military was the Indo-Pacific, said Mara Carlin, a top Pentagon policy official. The review, directs additional cooperation with allies and partners across the region to advance initiatives that contribute to regional stability and deter potential military aggression from China and threats from North Korea, she told reporters. In addition, it strengthens the combat credible deterrent against Russian aggression in Europe and enables NATO forces to operate more effectively, she said. The Middle East, on the other hand, remains an area of flux for the Pentagon after the long wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We have global responsibilities and must ensure the readiness and modernization of our forces, Carlin said. These considerations require us to make continuous changes to our Middle East posture, but we always have the capability to rapidly deploy forces to the region based on the threat environment. Speaking separately, a senior Pentagon official who declined to be identified downplayed any idea of radical shifts. In the first year of an administration, it's not the time when we would develop a major strategic level change to our posture, the official said. However, the official said, the Biden team felt the review necessary after the disruptive approach of his predecessor Donald Trump, who altered U.S. commitments abruptly. Under Trump, there were oftentimes a devaluing of ally and partner input and engagement, which eroded U.S. credibility and hard-won trust, the official said. The officials declined to answer questions on how the Global Posture Review sees U.S. force presence in ongoing conflict zones like the Middle East, East Africa and West Africa, and Eastern Europe. But they confirmed previously announced plans to do more in Guam and Australia, to beef up defenses against any threat from China. In Australia, you'll see new rotational fighter and bomber aircraft deployments, you'll see ground forces training and increased logistics cooperation, said Carlin. In Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands and Australia there will also be upgrades to airports and fuel and munitions storage facilities, she said. Asked if the review foresaw more increases in the U.S. presence in the Pacific region, Carlin said, we're moving the needle a bit. And what I'd like to think is, over the coming years, you will see that needle move more, she said. The chief of Britain's foreign spy service warned on Tuesday that the West's adversaries such as China and Russia were racing to master artificial intelligence in a way which could revolutionize geopolitics over the next decade. The world's spies, from Langley in London to Moscow and Beijing, are trying to grapple with seismic advances in technology that are challenging traditional human-led spying operations which dominated for thousands of years. Richard Moore, chief of the Secret Intelligence Service, known as MI6, said quantum engineering, engineered biology, vast troves of data and advances in computer power posed a threat that needed to be addressed by the West. Our adversaries are pouring money and ambition into mastering artificial intelligence, quantum computing and synthetic biology, because they know that mastering these technologies will give them leverage, Moore, who rarely surfaces for speeches, will say on Tuesday. Moore, a former diplomat who became MI6 chief in 2020, said technological progress over the next decade could outstrip all tech progress over the past century. As a society, we have yet to internalize this stark fact and its potential impact on global geopolitics. 
but it is a white-hot focus for MI6, he said. Of particular concern to the West spies are Russian and Chinese intelligence agencies which have rushed to harness the power of a range of sophisticated technologies, sometimes at a faster pace than in the West. Western intelligence agencies fear Beijing could within decades dominate all of the key emerging technologies, particularly artificial intelligence, synthetic biology and genetics. China's economic and military rise over the past 40 years is considered to be one of the most significant geopolitical events of recent times, alongside the 1991 fall of the Soviet Union which ended the Cold War. MI6, depicted by novelists as the employer of some of the most memorable fictional spies from John le Carre's George Smiley to Ian Fleming's James Bond, operates overseas and is tasked with defending Britain and its interests. Moore said the service would have to change to harness new technologies. We cannot hope to replicate the global tech industry, so we must tap into it, he will say. We must become more open, to stay secret. Singapore's health ministry said two travelers from Johannesburg who tested positive for the Omicron coronavirus variant in Sydney, had transited through Chani Airport. The two individuals left Johannesburg on November 27 on a Singapore Airlines flight and arrived at Chani on the same day for their transit flight, the ministry said in a statement. Both had tested negative for COVID-19 prior to departure, it added. The ministry said most of the travelers had remained in the transit area at Chani Airport. Of the seven who disembarked, six had been placed on a 10-day stay-at-home notice, while the seventh, a close contact of an infected individual on the flight, had been quarantined. Contact tracing is ongoing for airport staff who may have come into transient contact with the cases, the ministry said. Australian authorities said on Sunday that the two passengers who tested positive on arrival in Sydney were fully vaccinated and had been placed in isolation. Omicron has prompted countries across the globe including the US to limit travel from southern Africa, where the virus was first detected. The World Health Organization said it carries a very high risk of infection surges, but said no deaths have yet been linked to the new variant. The hefty financial penalties China imposed on a Taiwanese conglomerate that has donated to President Tsai Ing-wen's political party caught the island's business community by surprise as cross-strait tensions spill over to the economic realm. The fines and extra taxes, totaling US$74.1 million, United States dollars, are the results of an investigation launched against Far Eastern Group's subsidiaries operating in China. Authorities charge that those firms have violated rules in such areas as environmental protection protocols at factories. But it was the additional comments by Zhu Fenglian, the Taiwan Affairs Office spokesperson who announced the fines, that raised eyebrows. No one or any company is allowed to provide financial aid for Taiwan independence, secessionists while making money on the mainland, Zhu said during a news conference last week. The term, secessionists, refers to Tsai's ruling Democratic Progressive Party. While the DPP is independence-minded, the opposition Kuomintang Party is strongly colored by its Beijing-friendly bent. Far Eastern is a major DPP donor, which Chinese officials view as problematic. The ongoing investigation of the conglomerate could generate additional fines and may extend to other Taiwanese companies. What especially surprised the Taiwanese corporate community is that Far Eastern is a conglomerate with a long pedigree founded by a mainlander who moved from Shanghai to Taiwan. The company has been known for its pro-Beijing slant, but that did not keep it immune from being punished. Far Eastern is one of the most generous political donors in Taiwan and had long supported Kuomintang. But when the DPP won the presidential and legislative elections in 2016, the group decided to split its donations evenly between the Kuomintang and the DPP. During the 2020 elections, Far Eastern directed most of its funds to the DPP, a decision seen as a gambit to ward off friction for the group's business interests in Taiwan. But that maneuver has caught the unwanted attention of the Chinese government, according to many in Taiwan's business circles. China would not tolerate a company that played nice with both the Chinese government and Taiwan's DPP government in an attempt to run business smoothly on both sides of the strait, said an insider in Taiwan's business community. Taiwanese firms first started expanding onto the mainland in the 1990s with many attaining success, most notably Hunhai Precision Industry, the iPhone assembler known as Foxconn. The Taishang, as such businesspeople are called, now number close to 1 million on the mainland.
They have developed strong ties with the Chinese government over many years, contributing to their success stories. Due to that background, the majority of wealthy Taishang are friendly with Beijing and support the Kuomintang. Now Chinese disciplinary enforcers have targeted Far Eastern, a Taiwanese conglomerate that had enjoyed strong ties with China's government. Consequently, the Taishang are faced with a choice between continuing to earn money on the mainland or supporting size DPP, at the risk of losing the massive market that is China. Beijing's ultimate aim is to sever ties between the DPP and deep-pocketed Taiwanese corporations. Next year, the island will hold regional elections, which act as a bellwether for the next presidential election. A steep decline in donations from Taiwan's corporate community to the DPP would indirectly promote a victory in those elections by the Kuomintang, which has championed a conciliatory course with China. If that momentum is maintained, the Kuomintang would regain power in the 2024 presidential election according to China's script. Chinese pressure has shifted to a new phase from the past, said Tung. Li Wen, an advisory committee member at the Taiwan think tank, which delves into cross-strait relations. China has increased pressure on the economic front, and not just on the political and military sides, and the pressure from the Communist Party is approaching extremes, Tung added. Japan's crown prince criticized the media on Tuesday for falsities and terrible things in its coverage of the engagement of his daughter former Princess Mako, who relinquished her royal status to marry a non-royal last month. Mako, 30, postponed her marriage to Kei Kimuro, 30, for roughly three years over opposition stemming from a scandal involving his mother. Mako was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder during that period. In accordance with Japanese law, Mako relinquished her royal status when the two married by submitting paperwork at a local office and left to live in New York this month. Crown Prince Akashino, the emperor's brother, made the remarks, unusually candid for a Japanese royal, at a news conference to mark his 56th birthday. If you read the tabloids, well, I'm not sure how to say this exactly, but there's a lot of things in there that are fabricated, although there are also some opinions we should listen to, Akashino said when asked about the connection between media coverage and his daughter's diagnosis. Though Japan was captivated when Mako and Kimuro, a lawyer in the U.S., announced their engagement in 2017, revelations of the scandal touched off intense media scrutiny and criticism. As for articles on the internet, there are also lots of comments, and some of them say really terrible things, Akashino added. There are people who are deeply hurt by this slander. Some royal watchers said the furore over Mako's marriage, which even sparked protests against the wedding, might have been toned down with more adept handling by the Imperial Household Agency, IHA, which runs the family's lives, pointing to how similar incidents are handled by royals overseas. Akashino said the IHA does sometimes correct, mistaken, information on its website but implied more might be needed. If you are going to argue against an article, you have to set proper standards and then protest when those are exceeded, he said. Negative coverage may continue, so I think it is necessary to consider setting such standards in consultation with the IHA. Hong Kong has banned non-residents from entering the city from four African countries and plans to expand that to travelers who have been to Australia, Canada, Israel and six European countries in the past 21 days due to fears over Omicron. The World Health Organization, WHO, said on Monday the Omicron coronavirus variant carried a very high risk of infection surges, and countries around the world have tightened travel restrictions. In a statement late on Monday, the Hong Kong government said non-residents from Angola, Ethiopia, Nigeria and Zambia would not be allowed to enter the global financial hub as of November 30. Residents can return if they are vaccinated but will have to quarantine for seven days in a government facility and another two weeks in a hotel at their own cost. Non-Hong Kong residents from these four places will not be allowed to enter Hong Kong, the statement said. The most stringent quarantine requirements will also be implemented on relevant inbound travelers from these places. Additionally, non-residents who have been to Australia, Austria, Belgium, Canada, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Germany, Israel, and Italy in the past 21 days would not be allowed to enter the city from December 2. Vaccinated residents returning from these countries will have to do three weeks of hotel quarantine. Hong Kong last week banned non-Hong Kong residents arriving from South Africa, Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, Malawi, 
Mozambique, Namibia and Zimbabwe. Authorities have detected three people with the Omicron variant through mandatory testing while in quarantine, but it has no known coronavirus cases in the general community. The global financial hub is among the last places in the world pursuing a zero-COVID strategy and has some of the tightest travel restrictions. In coming months it hopes to partially reopen the border with mainland China, which also has no tolerance for coronavirus cases. Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte's chosen successor on Tuesday announced his withdrawal from the 2022 presidential race, saying it was, not yet my time. Senator Christopher Goh, a close aide to the president, entered the contest for the country's highest office two days before the November 15 deadline, after previously registering for the vice presidential race. His sudden exit narrows the field of candidates vying to replace Duterte, who is constitutionally barred from seeking a second six-year term. He is running for the Senate. My family doesn't want it either so I thought maybe this is not yet my time, Go told reporters. Go said his decision to withdraw was also to avoid causing more problems for Duterte, who he professed to love more than as a father. I remain loyal to him and I promise to be with him forever, Go said. In the past few days, I realize that my heart and my mind are contradicting my own actions. Most analysts had given Go little chance of success in the May election, though he was the most likely candidate to protect Duterte from criminal charges in the Philippines, and an international criminal court investigation into his deadly drug war. From the very start he has launched a lukewarm campaign and it's very obvious that he was just thrust into that job by President Duterte, said Jean Franco, a political science professor at the University of the Philippines. The son and namesake of former dictator Ferdinand Marcos has a commanding lead in the race, according to a recent survey by respected polling outfit Social Weather Stations. Marcos Jr. was followed by incumbent vice president and Duterte critic Lenny Robredo, celebrity mayor Francisco Domagaso and boxing great Manny Pacquiao. Duterte has been an ally of the controversial Marcos family, which had gone into exile in the U.S. after the Patriarch's humiliating downfall in 1986. But recently Duterte has been publicly critical of Marcos Jr., describing him as a weak leader, saddled with baggage. Sarah Duterte, his daughter, had been widely expected to run for president. But she has filed her candidacy for vice president, a position which holds very little power, and formed an alliance with Marcos Jr. Goh's exit from the tight election race could strengthen the political force of Marcos Jr. and Sarah, said Franco but she doubted that Duterte would endorse Marcos Jr. for his job. Goh's decision also comes after a tumultuous week when many of the leading presidential and vice-presidential candidates took drug tests after Duterte accused an unnamed candidate of snorting cocaine. Australian authorities said on Tuesday that an international traveller who was most likely infected with the Omicron variant has spent time in the community as officials rushed to track the person's close contacts and locations visited. New South Wales NSW health officials said initial testing strongly indicates the traveler who arrived in Sydney last week before the latest border restrictions has been infected with the Omicron variant of the coronavirus. The fully vaccinated person visited a busy shopping centre in Sydney while likely infectious, officials say. All passengers in the person's flight have been asked to self-isolate for 14 days regardless of their vaccination status. If confirmed, the total number of cases infected with the new variant in Australia will rise to six. All other cases have been in quarantine and are asymptomatic or display very mild symptoms. Authorities also said urgent genomic tests have begun to determine whether two other positive cases are infected with the Omicron variant. The report about the new probable community case comes ahead of a meeting of Australia's National Cabinet, a group of federal and state leaders, on Tuesday to review measures aimed at limiting the spread of the variant. Australia on Monday delayed the reopening of its international borders by two weeks, less than 36 hours before international students and skilled migrants were to be allowed to re-enter the country. Prime Minister Scott Morrison on Tuesday said he would urge state leaders to proceed with plans to open internal borders by Christmas. We need to make calm decisions. Don't get spooked by this, Morrison said during a news conference in Canberra. Omicron, dubbed a variant of concern, by the World Health Organization, is potentially more contagious than previous variants although there are signs it may be milder than initially feared.
Tough border restrictions and snap lockdowns have helped Australia keep its COVID-19 numbers relatively low, with around 210,000 cases and 2,006 deaths. The head of drugmaker Moderna said COVID-19 vaccines are unlikely to be as effective against the Omicron variant of the coronavirus as they have been previously, sparking fresh worry in financial markets about the trajectory of the pandemic. There is no world, I think, where the effectiveness is the same level. We had with Delta, Moderna chief executive Stefan Bansel told the Financial Times in an interview. I think it's going to be a material drop. I just don't know how much because we need to wait for the data. But all the scientists I've talked to are like, this is not going to be good. Vaccine resistance could lead to more sickness and hospitalizations and prolong the pandemic, and his comments triggered selling and growth exposed assets like oil, stocks and the Australian dollar. Bansell added that the high number of mutations on the protein spike the virus uses to infect human cells meant it was likely the current crop of vaccines would need to be modified. He had earlier said on CNBC that it could take months to begin shipping a vaccine that does work against Omicron. Fear of the new variant, despite a lack of information about its severity, has already triggered delays to some economic reopening plans and the reimposition of some travel and movement restrictions. A Myanmar junta court on Tuesday postponed giving a verdict in the incitement trial of deposed civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi the first judgment from her many cases that could see her jailed for decades. The Nobel laureate has been detained since the generals ousted her government in the early hours of February 1, ending the Southeast Asian country's brief democratic interlude. More than 1,200 people have been killed and over 10,000 arrested in a crackdown on dissent, according to a local monitoring group. The court, which had been due to rule on her trial for incitement against the military, a charge that carries a three-year prison term, adjourned the verdict, until December 6, said a source with knowledge of the case. Journalists have been barred from proceedings in the special court in the military-built capital Naypyidaw and Suu Kyi's lawyers were recently banned from speaking to the media. There was a heavy security presence on the streets leading to the special court in the capital Naypyidaw on Tuesday morning, an AFP correspondent said. The courtroom will remain off-limits to reporters for the verdict, Junta spokesman Zha Min Tun recently told AFP. Days after the coup Suu Kyi was hit with obscure charges for possessing unlicensed walkie-talkies, and for violating coronavirus restrictions during elections her National League for Democracy NLD, won in 2020. The junta has since added a slew of other indictments, including violating the Official Secrets Act, corruption and electoral fraud. Suu Kyi's long spells of house arrest under a previous junta were spent at her family's colonial-era mansion in Yangon, where she would appear before thousands gathered on the other side of her garden fence. Min Aung Lang's regime has confined her to an undisclosed location in the capital, with her link to the outside world limited to brief pre-trial meetings with her lawyers. In recent weeks, the trials of other ranking members of Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy have wrapped up, with the junta doling out harsh sentences. A former chief minister was sentenced to 75 years in jail earlier this month, while a close Suu Kyi aide was jailed for 20. The military, which has dominated life in Myanmar for decades, has defended its power grab, citing fraud allegations in last year's general election, which Suu Kyi's party won comfortably. International pressure on the junta to restore democracy swiftly has shown no sign of knocking the generals off course. The chairman of a Taiwanese conglomerate said on Tuesday he does not support independence from China after Beijing fined his company in an apparent warning to it and other businesses to tow the mainland's line on its sovereignty claims. China took aim last week at Taiwan's Far Eastern Group, which has interests ranging from hotels to petrochemicals, for a series of problems, from tax to fire safety, with fines totaling US$74.4 million. While China has not directly said the company is guilty of supporting independence for the Chinese claimed island, government statements on the fines have warned Taiwanese firms they could not expect to operate in China and support independence. In an open letter to Taiwan's United Daily News, Far Eastern Chairman Douglas Xu said that, under the current political atmosphere in Taiwan, certain public opinions put, a sense of guilt, on Taiwanese firms investing in China, which was unnecessary. In recent years, Many opinion polls showed most Taiwanese support maintaining the current status quo across the Taiwan Strait, he said. Like most Taiwanese, 
I hope that cross-strait relations maintain the status quo. I have always opposed Taiwan independence, he said. Xu said while Taiwanese companies were unable to resolve the political difficulties, they have always hoped for peace and normal exchanges and interactions. China has heaped pressure on the island to accept Beijing's rule. Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen says Taiwan will not bend to pressure, and that she will defend Taiwan's democracy and freedom. China said earlier this month it would hold those who support the island's formal independence, including companies, criminally liable. Asked to comment on Su's remarks and if he had been forced into making them by China, Taiwan Premier Su Seng Chong told reporters that China was always rude and unreasonable, and does not understand democracy, plurality or respect. Even China's own business elites could be vanished or punished, he added. It's even the case for the prettiest female stars, Su said, in a possible reference to tennis player Peng Shuai, whose whereabouts have caused international concern after she alleged that a former top Chinese official had sexually assaulted her. Hong Kong's zero-COVID policy is driving foreign talent out of the financial hub and putting off newcomers even as some firms offer pay packages not seen since the lavish days before the collapse of Lehman Brothers. While the new Omicron variant has renewed anxiety around the world, leading some countries to tighten travel curbs, Hong Kong and mainland China remain among the few places sticking to a zero-tolerance policy on any coronavirus infections. Once considered one of the most attractive cities for global talent, Hong Kong is now being shunned by many top professionals as people try to avoid or escape draconian quarantine rules. International business lobby groups have repeatedly warned that the city could lose talent and investment due to its travel restrictions, which can involve up to three weeks in mandatory quarantine. Now recruiters and relocation firms say an outflow of talent is well underway. Lars Cooper, managing director of relocation company Relosmart, said his firm saw a five-fold increase in enquires for shipments abroad since the pandemic began and a 14-fold drop in traffic the other way. The major factor definitely is the pandemic and the effect of the restrictions on entering Hong Kong, Cooper said. The government says the restrictions are needed to protect the community from the virus and to partially reopen the border with mainland China, which is Hong Kong's main source of economic growth. China is also largely isolating itself from the rest of the world. In response to Reuters' questions, a government spokesman said the zero infections goal was premised on the overall interest of the Hong Kong community, and that most residents looked forward to the mainland border reopening. Hong Kong remains a competitive city globally and a major regional base for international companies despite current challenges related to the global pandemic, he said in an email. Outflow of talent. Many non-residents are currently not allowed into Hong Kong, while residents returning to the city have to undergo two to three weeks of hotel quarantine at their own cost. Patient discharge rules require an extra two weeks in a designated hospital for anyone cured of the infection, which could result in people isolating for more than a month in either hotels or hospitals regardless of their symptoms. Those prospects are so unappealing, that another relocation company, Regal World Transport System Limited, said some clients had unusually reached out from overseas to move their belongings out of the city. They refused to return to Hong Kong after taking trips initially meant to be for family visits. Jobs to relocate people out of Hong Kong had increased by 30 to 40 percent over the past one minus one half years, said General Manager Francis Chung. The whole process was done on email or WhatsApp. They did not show up in person, he added. While a boon for relocators, the restrictions are giving recruiters major headaches. Recruiting firm Ambition said that while it had seen a 70 percent increase in mandates from Hong Kong-based employers over the past year, there had been a smaller 50% rise in hiring volume, underscoring the difficulty of convincing talent to relocate to Hong Kong currently. We have an outflow of talent at the moment, said Chris Auckland, Ambition's regional managing director for Asia, adding he expected it to continue, unless there are changes to the travel and quarantine restrictions in place. Faden International a recruiter focusing on financial services, saw a 40-50% to 50 surge in mandates this year, but a 10% drop in the number of people it has managed to bring in from overseas. Jamie Thorpe, Faden's head of Hong Kong, says some financial firms, desperate to hire, have sweetened their offers with buyouts, guaranteed bonuses, hefty living allowances and inflated job titles ensuring higher base salaries. We haven't seen these packages for a number of years. 
Last seen was pre-2008 crisis, Thorpe said. Prosecutors have asked the U.S. Supreme Court to review comedian Bill Cosby's overturned conviction for drugging and sexually assaulting a woman 15 years ago, they announced Monday. The U.S. Supreme Court can right what we believe is a grievous wrong, Kevin Steele, district attorney for Montgomery County, Pennsylvania said in a statement announcing that the appeal had been filed last Wednesday. Cosby was freed from prison on June 30 following a ruling by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court that he had been denied a fair trial in a move seen as a blow to the hashtag MeToo movement. At the time of his release, the comedian had been jailed since 2018 for assaulting Andrea Constant at his Philadelphia mansion in 2004 when she was an employee at Temple University. In its decision, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court focused on a non-prosecution agreement between a former district attorney and Cosby over evidence he gave in a civil case. Cosby had admitted giving qualudes, a now-banned party drug, to women with a view to having sex with them in deposition testimony in that case. However, the testimony was then used against him in a criminal trial years later brought forward by Steele. Cosby's lawyers argued he believed that testimony was immune from prosecution in criminal court when he gave it. They argued that the non-prosecution agreement meant he should not have been charged, which the Pennsylvania Supreme Court justices agreed with. However, Steele said Monday that, petitioning to ask the High Court for review was the right thing to do, and denounced the, far-reaching negative consequences, of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's decision. In his appeal to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, Cosby presented a 2005 press release as evidence of the first prosecutor's statement not to prosecute him. Steele said Monday that the decision merited appeal because it set a precedent, that prosecutors' statements in press releases now seemingly create immunity. A spokesman for the 84-year-old actor criticized the latest appeal as a pathetic last-ditch effort, in a statement quoted by multiple U.S. news outlets. Cosby served more than two years of a three- to ten-year sentence for aggravated indecent assault and has always maintained his innocence. Although more than 60 women charged that they had been victims of sexual assault by Cosby, he was tried criminally only for Constan's assault, since the statute of limitations had expired in the other cases. Cosby shattered racial barriers with his Emmy-winning role on I Spy in the 1960s and also starred as a dad and doctor on the hit TV series, The Cosby Show, in the 1980s. Singapore will hold off on more reopening measures while it evaluates the Omicron COVID-19 variant and will increase testing of travelers and frontline workers to reduce the risk of local transmission, authorities said today. A quarantine-free entry policy for vaccinated arrivals in the Asian financial and travel hub will not be extended to more countries for now, while current social distancing measures will remain in place, Health Minister Ong Yi Kung said. This is a prudent thing to do for now, when we are faced with a major uncertainty, Ong told a media briefing, adding the variant had not yet been detected locally. Singapore will be prioritizing use of COVID-19 polymerase chain reaction PCR, tests produced by Thermo Fisher on travelers. Thermo Fisher said it is able to detect the Omicron variant. Any Omicron cases found in Singapore will be placed in government healthcare facilities rather than the home isolation so far used for mild COVID-19 cases. Ong said Singapore's high vaccination rate should offer some protection against the variant. The city-state had earlier restricted arrivals from South African countries, and deferred the expansion of the quarantine-free entry program for vaccinated travelers from several Middle East countries, given, their proximity as transport nodes to the affected countries. A 15-year-old boy killed three fellow high school students and wounded eight other people upon opening fire with a semi-automatic handgun at a Michigan high school, and he was quickly taken into custody, police said. At least one of those wounded was a teacher at Oxford High School in Oxford, Michigan, about 65 kilometers north of Detroit, the Oakland County Sheriff's Office said. Those killed were a 16-year-old boy, a 17-year-old girl and a 14-year-old girl, Under Sheriff Michael McCabe told reporters at the scene. The suspect, a sophomore at the school, was believed to have acted alone and was arrested without resistance after firing 15 to 20 shots, McCabe said. The whole thing lasted five minutes, McCabe said. WDIV television reported the suspect divulged nothing to police and demanded his right to speak with a lawyer. Student Abby Hodder told the Detroit Free Press that she was in chemistry class when she heard the sound of glass breaking. 
My teacher kind of ran out and was scrambling. Hotter, 15, told the newspaper. The next thing I knew I saw he was pushing tables. It's part of school protocol to barricade, so we all knew, barricade, barricade down. And we all started pushing tables. McCabe praised the school for its preparation for a shooting and an orderly evacuation. President Joe Biden was told of the shooting by National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan in advance of a tour and remarks at a Minnesota Technical College, Press Secretary Jan Psaki told reporters. My heart goes out to the families enduring the unimaginable grief of losing a loved one, Biden said from Minnesota. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer called the shooting, horrific. As Michiganders, we have a responsibility to do everything we can to protect each other from gun violence, Whitmer, a Democrat, said in a statement. Brazil's health regulator today reported the discovery of two preliminary cases of the Omicron coronavirus variant in a traveler from South Africa where it was first detected, and his wife. Positive samples from the two Brazilians will now be sent for further laboratory analysis for confirmation, the Anvisa regulator said in a statement. If confirmed, they would be the first Omicron cases in Latin America. The passenger arrived at the international airport at Garulas in Sao Paulo on November 23, with a negative coronavirus test. Two days later, he and his wife returned to the airport for new tests required to take a flight back to South Africa. Both tested positive. The new COVID-19 variant, which the World Health Organization says poses a very high risk, has prompted many countries to shut their borders. Slovenia announced yesterday it would no longer use the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine after experts confirmed a 20-year-old died earlier this year because of the jab. The Alpine EU member suspended vaccinations with Johnson & Johnson in September after the woman died of a brain hemorrhage and blood clots just days after getting vaccinated. An expert commission confirmed in a report that the woman suffered a rare blood clotting condition, known as vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia. The temporary suspension of vaccinations with Janssen, produced by Johnson & Johnson, in force until now, will become permanent, Health Minister Yanis Poklukar told a news conference after the commission published its findings. Vaccinations with AstraZeneca, which uses viral vector technology like Johnson & Johnson and has also been linked to rare blood clots, most likely, will also be discontinued, according to Boyana Biovic, who heads the group advising the government on vaccinations. The woman's death in September reportedly was the country's second case linked to Johnson & Johnson after the wife of a Slovenian diplomat based in Paris died in May days after being vaccinated. With over 16 million Johnson & Johnson's vaccine doses being administrated in the European Union until the end of October, six deaths linked to the jab have been confirmed, according to the Slovenian authorities. Since September thousands have attended protests in Slovenia against coronavirus restrictions and plans to make vaccination mandatory. Some 54% of the country's 2 million people have been fully vaccinated, below the EU-wide rate of 68%. The World Health Organization, WHO, said yesterday that those not fully vaccinated against COVID-19 who are also vulnerable to the disease, including over 60s, should put off travel to areas with community transmission. WHO also said blanket travel bans would not stop the spread of the Omicron variant. The new COVID-19 variant of concern, which WHO says poses a very high risk globally, has prompted many countries to shut their borders. Blanket travel bans will not prevent the international spread, and they place a heavy burden on lives and livelihoods, WHO said in a travel advice statement on Omicron. In addition, they can adversely impact global health efforts during a pandemic by disincentivizing countries to report and share epidemiological and sequencing data. First reported to WHO less than a week ago after being detected in southern Africa earlier this month, Omicron has already appeared in several countries. WHO noted the increasing number of governments introducing travel measures, including temporarily banning arrivals from countries where the variant has been found. WHO said that as of Sunday, 56 countries were reportedly implementing travel measures aimed at potentially delaying the importation of the new variant. It is expected that the Omicron variant will be detected in an increasing number of countries as national authorities step up their surveillance and sequencing activities, it said.
WHO later issued a correction to the final part of that travel advice, relating who should be advised to postpone travel, and to where. Persons who have not been fully vaccinated or do not have proof of previous SARS-CoV-2 infection and are at increased risk of developing severe disease and dying, including people 60 years of age or older or those with comorbidities that present increased risk of severe COVID-19, heart disease, cancer and diabetes, should be advised to postpone travel to areas with community transmission, whose corrected line said. Elsewhere, WHO advised countries to apply an evidence-informed and risk-based approach when implementing travel measures. The UN Health Agency said national authorities in countries of departure, transit and arrival could apply mitigation measures that might delay or reduce the exportation and importation of the variant. They could include screening passengers, testing and quarantine. All measures should be commensurate with the risk, time-limited and applied with respect to travelers' dignity, human rights and fundamental freedoms. WHO said that, Essential international travel, including for humanitarian missions, repatriations and transport of vital supplies, should always be prioritized during the pandemic. Earlier yesterday, WHO Chief Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus told member states to keep calm and take rational steps in response to Omicron. We call on all member states to take rational, proportional risk reduction measures, he said. The global response must be calm, coordinated and coherent. Tedros stressed that it remains unclear how dangerous the variant is. We still have more questions than answers about the effect of Omicron on transmission, severity of disease, and the effectiveness of tests, therapeutics and vaccines, he said. WHO chief said it was understandable that countries wanted to protect their citizens against a variant that we don't yet fully understand. But I am equally concerned that several member states are introducing blunt, blanket measures that are not evidence-based or effective on their own, and which will only worsen inequities. It is too early to know whether Omicron variant of COVID-19 will lead to severe disease, but preliminary information from South Africa indicates it does not result in unusual symptoms, top U.S. infectious disease expert Anthony Fauci said yesterday. Fauci said there were 226 confirmed cases of the variant in 20 countries as of yesterday morning but Omicron had not been detected yet in the U.S. Fears about the variant have rattled financial markets and sparked concerns about the strength of the global economic recovery as the world continues to fight the coronavirus pandemic. It is very difficult to know whether or not this particular variant is going to result in severe disease, Fauci told reporters in a briefing. Although some preliminary information from South Africa suggests no unusual symptoms, we do not know, and it is too early to tell. President Joe Biden and his administration have pressed Americans to take advantage of vaccines and booster shots, but vaccine hesitancy in a segment of the U.S. population has thwarted efforts to tame the virus spread. About 69% of Americans aged 12 and up are fully vaccinated. We are hoping, and I think with good reason, to feel good that there will be some degree of protection against the variant from the vaccines, Fauci said. If you're unvaccinated, get vaccinated. And if you're vaccinated, get boosted. Biden, whose poll numbers have suffered in part amid frustration that the pandemic is not under control, on Monday urged Americans not to panic about the new variant. To beat the pandemic, we have to vaccinate the world as well, the president said. Asked yesterday if the U.S. was doing enough to vaccinate the rest of the world, Fauci noted the U.S. was doing more than other nations. Enough is a tough word. Are we doing a lot? We are doing an awful lot, he said. Fauci said getting vaccines into people's arms in southern African countries and other low- and middle-income countries had proven difficult logistically and many doses that were shipped went unused. Other African countries have actually told us not to ship any more vaccine because they have not been able to adequately utilize it, he said. Canada, seeking to halt the spread of the Omicron coronavirus variant, will require people arriving by air from all nations except the U.S. to take a COVID-19 test, Health Minister Jean-Yves Duclos said yesterday. Ottawa is also expanding a ban on travelers from southern Africa to cover three more nations, bringing the total to 10. Canada has identified seven people with the new variant, at least four of whom were recently in Nigeria. The Canadian government also said it was in advanced talks with Pfizer Inc. and Merck and Co. Inc. regarding a purchase agreement for COVID-19 antiviral drugs. All air travelers coming from outside Canada, 
apart from the U.S., will now need to be tested at the airport where they are landing in Canada, DeClose told a briefing. They will then need to isolate themselves until they get the results of their test. DeClose said the Liberal government would talk to the 10 provinces to see whether the testing requirement could be extended, if needed, to cover everyone entering the country, both by air and across the U.S. land border. The provinces would need to agree to the extension. We don't know if it would need to be done, he said, adding no decision had been taken. Transport Minister Omar Algebras said foreign nationals who had been to Nigeria, Malawi and Egypt in the previous 14 days would be temporarily banned from entering Canada. Last week Ottawa barred travellers who had recently been to South Africa, Namibia, Lesotho, Botswana, Eswatini, Zimbabwe and Mozambique. Canadians and permanent residents who have been in the 10 countries, even those who are fully vaccinated, must also be tested before entering Canada, he added. The western Canadian province of Alberta has confirmed one case of the Omicron variant, Chief Medical Officer Dina Hinshaw told reporters yesterday. Hinshaw said the person identified in Alberta was asymptomatic and had recently traveled from Nigeria and Holland. British Columbia also reported its first case of the new variant, with the individual having recently returned from traveling to Nigeria. The premiers of Ontario and Quebec, Canada's two most populous provinces, are calling on Ottawa to impose tougher measures and more testing for the virus. The U.S. and China are engaged in an arms race to develop the most lethal hypersonic weapons, the U.S. Air Force Secretary said yesterday, as Beijing and Washington build and test more and more of the high-speed next-generation arms. There is an arms race, not necessarily for increased numbers, but for increased quality, Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall told Reuters during an interview in his Pentagon offices. It's an arms race that has been going on for quite some time. The Chinese have been at it very aggressively. In October, the top U.S. military officer, General Mark Milley, confirmed a Chinese hypersonic weapons test that military experts say appears to show Beijing's pursuit of an Earth-orbiting system designed to evade American missile defenses. This year the Pentagon has held several hypersonic weapons tests with mixed success. In October, the Navy successfully tested a booster rocket motor that would be used to power a launch vehicle carrying a hypersonic weapon aloft. Hypersonic weapons travel in the upper atmosphere at speeds of more than five times the speed of sound, or about 6,200 km per hour. Kendall noted that while the U.S. military has focused funds on Iraq and Afghanistan, it has taken its eye off the ball in terms of hypersonic weapons. This isn't saying we've done nothing, but we haven't done enough, he said. As the Pentagon enters the 2023 annual budget cycle, Kendall hopes to raise funds with the retirement of older and expensive to maintain systems in favor of new systems, including hypersonic development programs. I love the A-10. The C-130 is a great aircraft that's been very capable and very effective for a lot of missions. The MQ-9S have been very effective for counterterrorism and so on. They're still useful, but none of these things scare China, Kendall said referring to a more than 40-year-old combat aircraft, a plane for carrying cargo, and widely used drones, respectively. Defense contractors hope to capitalize on the shift to hypersonic weapons not only by building them, but also by developing new detection and defeat mechanisms. Arms makers Lockheed Martin Corp., Northrop Grumman Corp. and Raytheon Technologies Corp. have all touted their hypersonic weapons programs to investors as world focus shifted to the new arms race for an emerging class of weapon. Still, the Pentagon wants defense contractors to cut the ultimate cost of hypersonic weapons, the head of research and development has said, as the next generation of super-fast missiles being developed currently costs tens of millions per unit. A woman who says she was sexually abused by the late financier Jeffrey Epstein at 14 years old told jurors yesterday at Ghislaine Maxwell's criminal trial that the British socialite facilitated and participated in some sexual encounters. The woman, known by the pseudonym Jane, took the stand for the government on the second day of Maxwell's sex abuse trial in Manhattan Federal Court. During cross-examination, a lawyer for Maxwell questioned Jane, now in her early 40s, about how she did not report the alleged abuse until decades after it occurred. Maxwell, 59, faces sex trafficking and other charges. Prosecutors say she recruited and groomed Jane and three other underage girls for Epstein to abuse between 1994 and 2004.
Epstein killed himself in a Manhattan jail cell in 2019 while awaiting trial on sex abuse charges. Maxwell has pleaded not guilty, and her lawyers have said she is being scapegoated because Epstein is no longer alive. They have said Jane and the other alleged victims, who are also expected to testify at the trial, have faulty memories and financial incentives to accuse Maxwell. During three hours of explicit and emotional testimony, Jane said Maxwell and Epstein first approached her and a group of friends when they were eating ice cream at an arts summer camp in Michigan in the summer of 1994. Jane, a singer, said her family was struggling financially after her father's death the prior year. She said Epstein and Maxwell told her that they were benefactors of her camp and awarded many student scholarships. They remained in touch after Jane returned home to Palm Beach, Florida, where Epstein also had a home, Jane testified. She said Maxwell sometimes took her to the movies or spent time with her by Epstein's pool. She said they talked about school, including whether Jane had a boyfriend. Jane testified that she said she did not, and that Maxwell then told her, once you f asterisk asterisk them, you can always f asterisk asterisk them again because they're grandfathered in. I giggled because I didn't understand what grandfathered meant, Jane testified. Prosecutors said in a 2021 indictment against Maxwell that behavior like buying girls gifts and discussing sexual topics amounted to grooming them for abuse. As Jane spoke, Maxwell occasionally put on a pair of glasses, leaned forward and took notes on post-its, which she passed to her attorneys. Jane said she had a sexual encounter with Epstein in the pool room of his Palm Beach house while still 14. He pulled me on top of himself and proceeded to masturbate on me, Jane said. I was terrified and felt gross and I felt ashamed. On other occasions, also at age 14, Jane said Maxwell and Epstein would take her to a massage table in his Palm Beach house and demonstrate how Epstein liked to be massaged. The massages transitioned into sexual activity, and Maxwell sometimes touched her breasts, Jane said. Jane described Maxwell's demeanor as, very casual, during these interactions. Maxwell's lawyers have said Jane and other accusers received payouts from a fund set up by Epstein's estate to compensate victims. The fund started up in mid-2020 and ended its claims process in August of 2021 after giving more than US$121 million to about 138 people. In his opening statement on Monday, Maxwell attorney Bobby Sternheim said accusers could enhance their rewards by cooperating with prosecutors. Sternheim called Jane a very successful actress who never accused Maxwell of wrongdoing before Epstein's death. She is a pro at playing roles and as her scripts and characters change, so has the story that you will hear, Sternheim said. During cross-examination, Jane confirmed she did not report the alleged incidents to law enforcement until 2019. When Maxwell attorney Laura Menninger asked whether she told family members and close friends about Maxwell's alleged role, Jane said, I don't know. I was very reluctant to give details, Jane said. I didn't want to share it with them in the first place. Jane said in testimony that she had been employed as an actor for 22 years and was awarded US$5 million by the compensation fund. She is expected to return for further cross-examination today. A panel of U.S. health experts yesterday voted to recommend Merck's COVID pill for high-risk adults, a new form of treatment that is easy to administer and could prove better able to withstand variants, including Omicron. Molnipiravir, already authorized in Britain, has been shown to reduce the rate of hospitalizations and deaths among people at high risk of developing severe COVID when it is taken within five days of symptom onset. The Food and Drug Administration FDA, which convened yesterday's meeting, is now expected to grant an emergency use authorization EUA, for the treatment, meaning millions of courses will soon be stocked in pharmacies. The independent scientists appointed by the FDA voted 13 in favor and 10 against authorization, a narrow win that reflected some concerns over a recent downgrading of the treatment's efficacy results, as well as misgivings over potential side effects. Sasha Dublin, of the Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute, said that while she found the benefits compelling and voted, yes, it will be important to make sure the treatment is strictly regulated and goes only to patients best suited for it. Daria Hazuda, Merck's Vice President of Infectious Disease Discovery, told AFP after the vote, 
We need as many tools in the toolbox as possible to really make an advance in this pandemic as this virus continues to evolve. Last week, Merck, known as MSD outside the US and Canada, released full results from a clinical trial of 1,400 people. These showed the pill reduced the risk of hospitalizations and death by 30%, a significant result albeit more modest than an earlier advertised figure of 50%, which was based on an analysis from half the number of patients. Hazuda told AFP the reason might be an unexplained drop in the rate of severe cases in the placebo group during the second half of the study, which may have made the drug appear less effective than it was. Briefing documents uploaded by the FDA ahead of the meeting illustrated the benefit-risk balance the experts were asked to assess. Potential harmful effects were noted on fetal development, as seen in studies on rats and rabbits, and Merck said it would not recommend use of molnupiravir in pregnant women. The company did not seek authorization for children, and the FDA said it didn't plan to carry out pediatric trials until safety is established in juvenile rats over concerns related to bone formation. Currently, the most effective treatment for COVID is monoclonal antibodies, which are administered via a drip and have been shown to reduce the risk of severe cases in high-risk patients by up to 70%. But pills have the advantage of being far more easy to use and, unlike antibodies, don't require a visit to an infusion site. Merck's treatment is taken as four capsules, twice a day, over five days, for a total of 40 pills. It was found to be safe in its clinical trial, with non-serious adverse events such as diarrhea and dizziness occurring roughly equally between the placebo group and the drug group. Molnupiravir which was developed in partnership with Ridgeback Biotherapeutics, works by introducing mutations into the genetic material of the coronavirus, inhibiting its ability to replicate. It is thought likely to be more variant-proof than monoclonal antibodies or vaccines, because unlike them, it does not target the ever-mutating spike proteins that dot the surface of the virus. Molnupiravir's error-driving mechanism has also raised concerns, including that it could harm mammal DNA. In its presentation, However, the FDA said rat studies showed this effect was negligible. Another worry is whether the mutations the pill introduces might lead to a dangerous evolution of the virus itself, spurring new variants. This is, currently a theoretical concern, that hasn't been found in real life, the FDA said. Treating people should reduce the probability that you're going to transmit these super variants, as opposed to allowing untreated people to transmit the virus, stressed Hazuda. The U.S. government has committed to buying 3.1 million courses of molnupiravir for approximately US$2.2 billion, United States dollars, with the option to purchase more. Pfizer is also seeking authorization for a COVID pill that cut hospitalizations and deaths by nearly 90%. Britain plans to allow people who have tested positive for HIV to join the armed forces if they no longer carry a detectable amount of the virus, its defense ministry said today. Military personnel who become infected with HIV after enlistment can already remain in the armed forces, though they are classed as not fully fit, a categorization which the defense ministry said it planned to change to. Drug treatment has revolutionized the lives and outcomes of people diagnosed with HIV. As a modern and inclusive employer, it is only right that we recognize and act on the latest scientific evidence, Junior Defense Minister Leo Doherty said. The U.S. also currently bans people with HIV from joining its armed forces, and has faced legal challenge over its policy not to allow enlisted personnel who are HIV positive to commission as officers. With the right treatment, the amount of virus in the blood of people infected with HIV can be reduced to undetectable levels, which in turn effectively eliminates the chances of them passing the virus which causes AIDS on to others. From early next year, serving British military personnel who have tested positive for HIV, but no longer carry a detectable viral load, will be classed as fully fit, meaning they can be deployed on military operations. People taking drugs that reduce the risk of contracting HIV will also be able to join the armed forces. Historically anyone taking regular medication has been unable to join Britain's armed forces, with limited exceptions such as contraceptives. The planned changes were welcomed by Britain's National AIDS Trust. A career in the armed forces was the only career not open to people living with HIV in the UK and with this much-needed change the military will be more able to meet its obligation to promote inclusivity within its ranks, said Deborah Gold, the trust's chief executive.
First U.S. Omicron case found in fully vaxxed traveler Reuters December 2, 2021 7.15 a.m. 123 shares Facebook sharing button 85 Twitter sharing button 34 WhatsApp sharing button mail sharing button The Biden administration has asked fully vaccinated people to seek booster shots after their initial doses. AP Pick, Washington. The U.S. yesterday identified its first known COVID case caused by the Omicron variant, discovered in a fully vaccinated patient who traveled to South Africa, as scientists continue to study the risks the new version could pose. Public health officials said the infected person, who had mild and improving symptoms, returned to the U.S. from South Africa on November 22 and tested positive seven days later. That patient was fully vaccinated but did not have a booster shot, according to Dr. Anthony Fauci, the top U.S. infectious disease official, who briefed reporters at the White House. The person is in self-quarantine and all of the patient's close contacts have tested negative, he said. Key questions remain about the new variant, which mutated in ways that health experts think could improve its ability to both spread and evade some of the defenses provided by vaccines. Work is underway to update those vaccines, if necessary. Omicron has been found in two dozen countries, including several in Europe plus Canada, Australia, Japan, Hong Kong and Israel. The U.S. has not yet detected community transmission of Omicron. Across much of the country, COVID transmission remains high but new cases have held fairly steady over the last two weeks, according to a Reuters tally. Three quarters of all COVID samples in South Africa are now Omicron. The critical thing is, over the next week or so, will we see any community transmission from that case, said Andy Peckish, virologist at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. That's a critical thing that we want to keep an eye on. Peckish said the variant could make the relatively new set of antiviral pills from Merck and Pfizer more important by helping to reduce the severity of infections. Fauci said it could take two weeks or more to gain insight into how easily the variant spreads from person to person, how severe is the disease it causes and whether it can bypass the protections provided by vaccines currently available. The Biden administration has asked fully vaccinated people to seek booster shots after their initial doses. 60% of Americans are fully vaccinated and about a fifth of those people took boosters, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. For days, U.S. health officials have said the new variant, first detected in Southern Africa and announced on November 25, was likely already in the U.S. as dozens of other countries also detected its presence. This new variant is a cause for concern but not a cause for panic, Biden said yesterday before the Omicron case was announced. A spokesman, Jen Psaki, said the president had been briefed by his team on the first known U.S. case. Benchmark U.S. stock indexes turned negative on the news. The S&P 500 fell by more than 1 percent, extending to nearly 4 percent its loss in price terms over the past week. The World Health Organization named the variant as one of concern on Friday. The U.S. has barred nearly all foreigners who have been in one of eight Southern African countries. On Tuesday, the CDC directed airlines to disclose names and other information of passengers who have been to those countries. WHO says world creating. Toxic. Recipe for new strains The World Health Organization, WHO, warned yesterday that the world was creating toxic conditions for new COVID-19 variants like Omicron to emerge and then spread around the globe. WHO said the combination of low vaccination coverage across the planet, mixed with very low testing to track the virus, was a fertile breeding ground. The UN Health Agency stressed that measures to stop the globally dominant Delta variant would also hinder Omicron. The new variant of concern has rattled countries around the world. We need to use the tools we already have to prevent transmission and save lives from Delta. And if we do that, we will also prevent transmission and save lives from Omicron, WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus told a press conference. But if countries and individuals don't do what they need to do to stop transmission of Delta, they won't stop Omicron either. Globally, we have a toxic mix of low vaccine coverage, and very low testing, a recipe for breeding and amplifying variants. That's why we continue to urge countries to, ensure equitable access to vaccines, tests and therapeutics all over the world. Omicron was first reported to WHO from South Africa on November 24, while the first known laboratory-confirmed case was identified from a specimen collected on November 9. 
Holland said Tuesday it had found the variant in two samples taken on November 19 and November 23, one having recently been to Southern Africa and the other having no travel history. Maria van Kerkova, whose COVID-19 technical lead, said timelines around first detections of Omicron may change as there was a backlog of sequencing of cases that occurred in November. Tedros said WHO was taking the emergence of Omicron extremely seriously, but added that the mutation should not surprise us. This is what viruses do, and it's what this virus will continue to do, as we long as we allow it to continue spreading. Tedros said Omicron was in at least 23 countries, with that number expected to grow. Van Kerkova said WHO was not yet aware of any deaths associated with Omicron. WHO said it could take several weeks to complete studies of Omicron to see if there are any changes in transmissibility, severity or implications for COVID vaccines, tests and treatments. We expect to have more information on transmission within days, not necessarily weeks, but in days, said Van Kerkova. The more this virus circulates, the more infections there will be. The more infections there will be, the more people will die, and this is something that can be prevented. Several countries have imposed travel bans on flights from South Africa, which Van Kerkova said was making it difficult to send samples from the country, even though they were willing to share them. Van Kerkova said, we will get out of this pandemic but everyday decisions need to be made on whether or not we're getting closer to the end of this pandemic or we're actually taking steps to prolong it. Michael Ryan, whose emergencies director, said it was not the time for governments to be passing responsibility for management of the pandemic over to their citizens. Certainly we are dealing with a crisis now. That crisis is in Europe, and it's being driven by the Delta variant, he said. Alec Baldwin has said he did not pull the trigger of the gun he was holding that killed a cinematographer on the movie set of, Rust. In his first major interview since the tragedy in October, the US actor also said he has, no idea, how a live round had gotten onto the set of the low-budget western in New Mexico. The trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger, he said in an excerpt of an interview with ABC News released on Wednesday. No, no, no. I would never point a gun at anyone and pull the trigger at them. Never. In the interview, set to air in full on ABC on Thursday evening, Baldwin did not elaborate on how the weapon had gone off. Baldwin, also a producer on Rust, was rehearsing a scene in which his character brandishes a Colt .45 when cinematographer Helena Hutchins was shot and killed. The weapon was meant to contain dummy, or fake, rounds, and Baldwin was asked in the interview how a real bullet had ended up within the firearm. I have no idea. Someone put a live bullet in a gun. A bullet that wasn't even supposed to be on the property, said Baldwin. Prosecutors have refused to rule out criminal charges against anyone involved with Rust, including Baldwin and armorer Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. Gutierrez-Reed has also said she has no idea why live rounds were present. On Tuesday, Investigators said Seth Kenny, an Arizona weapon rental supplier, may have supplied reloaded ammunition that matched the cartridge suspected to have contained the live round that killed Hutchins. Reloaded ammunition refers to rounds that are assembled from component parts, not manufactured as complete live rounds. The sheriff's office has taken a huge step forward today to unearth the full truth of who put the live rounds on the rust set, Gutierrez Reed's lawyers said in a statement Tuesday. The full, one-hour ABC interview with Baldwin airs on Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 0100 GMT Friday. Even now, I find it hard to believe, says a tearful Baldwin in the preview clip. It just doesn't seem real to me. I think back, and I think of, what could I have done, he says. The U.S. Army are keen to expand its access and basing arrangements in Southeast Asia as part of a strategy to deter China, their secretary said yesterday. Christine Wormuth told a Washington think tank such a posture shift was in the interests of both the U.S. and its allies and partners in the region, but there was a need to be realistic about what is possible. She said positioning U.S. military equipment in Asia had been heavily oriented towards Northeast Asia. There is very much a desire to be able to expand our access and basing arrangements more into Southeast Asia, because if we were able to do that, we would have a more dispersed posture that would give us much more flexibility, she told the Center for Strategic and International Studies.
It is very much in our interests and in the interest of our allies and partners, to explore how we can shift that posture over time, she said, while adding, but my own view is that we need to be realistic about what is possible and as we look at the operational challenges we need to have realistic assumptions about the locations from where we might be able to operate. Wormuth spoke at a time when the Biden administration has been stepping up engagement with Southeast Asia, a region it sees as central to its strategy of competition with an ever more assertive and militarily expanding China. The top U.S. diplomat for East Asia, Assistant Secretary of State Daniel Kreitenbrink, is currently in Southeast Asia in the latest visit by a senior U.S. official. Wormuth did not say where the army is interested in expanding its access, but said progress with the Philippines in renewing an agreement allowing the rotational presence of U.S. troops had been very important. She said a key part of an ongoing Pentagon force posture review was looking for more opportunities to pre-position equipment. She said it was important to work collectively to avoid war in Asia and the best strategy was strong deterrence to ensure that Chinese leader Xi Jinping, to the extent that he might think about trying to forcibly reunify with Taiwan will decide that, today is not the day to do that. Among the roles for the army was in, long-range fires, including hypersonic weapons it plans to start fielding, Wormuth said. She stressed concerns about possible misunderstandings that could lead to conflict and the need to avoid, second Cold War framing, and to maintain lines of communication with Beijing. We really need to have channels where we can have dialogue with the Chinese government. That's something I worry about, she said. The Omicron variant has propelled a sharp rise in coronavirus cases in South Africa in recent weeks, health officials told Parliament yesterday, calling the situation, worrying. There had been an, exponential increase, over the past two weeks, from a weekly average of around 300 new cases per day to 1,000 last week and most recently 3,500, said Michelle Groom of the National Institute for Communicable Diseases NICD. The degree of increase is worrying, Groom added. Late yesterday, the NICD said 8,561 new cases were reported nationwide over 24 hours, up from almost 4,400 the day before and 2,300 on Monday. South Africa was the first country to detect Omicron, a new variant of the coronavirus with a high number of mutations, reporting its first cases on November 25 to the World Health Organization. In Gauteng, South Africa's most populous and most affected province which includes the city of Johannesburg, the rate of tests coming back positive rose to 27% yesterday. Groom said the figures represented very early stages of the fourth wave of COVID-19 infections. The rapidly increasing number of new daily cases was fueled by the variant, dubbed Omicron, she added. After first spreading through younger people aged 10 to 29, many celebrating the end of the school year in the Southern Hemisphere's spring, it is starting to move to older age groups. South Africa is the country hit hardest on the continent by the pandemic with almost 3 million cases. That figure was underestimated, far below the true number of real cases, Groom said highlighting that, some people are asymptomatic, and others, for all sorts of reasons may not test. The death toll in the latest U.S. school shooting rose to four yesterday after a 17-year-old student died from his wounds in the attack at a Michigan high school, local police said. The Oakland County Sheriff's Office said in a statement that Justin Schilling, who was a student at Oxford High School in the rural town of Oxford, Michigan, succumbed to his wounds in the attack. Police on Tuesday said that a 15-year-old male student opened fire with a semi-automatic handgun in the high school, shooting at least 30 rounds that have now left four students dead and six students and one teacher wounded. There was no immediate explanation for the attack, which sent panic through the 1,800 students at the school, according to police. The shooter used a 9mm Sig Sauer pistol that his father bought for him on November 26, the day after Thanksgiving known as Black Friday for massive sales put on by stores nationwide to launch the Christmas gift shopping period, the police said. The suspect, a second-year student, apparently brought the gun into school with a backpack and multiple ammunition magazines. He surrendered to police in the hallway of the school, with several rounds still in the gun, they said. Police said they had searched the home of the suspect. This is expected to be a lengthy investigation and hundreds of interviews will be conducted, they said in a statement.
A UN committee yesterday deferred a decision on who will represent Afghanistan and Myanmar at the United Nations, said the panel's chair, meaning the Afghan Taliban and Myanmar junta will not be allowed into the world body for now. Rival claims were made for the seats of both countries with the Taliban and Myanmar's junta pitted against ambassadors appointed by the governments they ousted this year. UN acceptance of the Taliban or Myanmar's junta would be a step toward the international recognition sought by both. The nine-member UN Credentials Committee, which includes Russia, China and the US, met at UN headquarters to consider the credentials of all 193 members for the current session of the UN General Assembly. Several diplomats had told Reuters that the committee was likely to defer its decisions on the representation of Afghanistan and Myanmar on the understanding that the current ambassadors for both countries remain in those seats. While the committee chair, Sweden's UN Ambassador Anna Karen Enestrom, told reporters the decisions had been deferred, she declined to comment on whether the current ambassadors for Afghanistan and Myanmar would still represent their countries. The committee, which also includes the Bahamas, Bhutan, Chile, Namibia, Sierra Leone and Sweden, will now send its report on the credentials of all members to the UN General Assembly for approval before the end of the year. Both the committee and the General Assembly traditionally make decisions on credentials by consensus, diplomats say. Leverage the Taliban, which seized power in mid-August from the internationally recognized government, have nominated their Doha-based spokesman Sahail Shaheen as Afghanistan's UN ambassador. The current UN ambassador appointed by the ousted government, Ghulam Isazai, has also asked to keep the seat. When the Taliban last ruled Afghanistan between 1996 and 2001, the ambassador of the government they toppled remained the UN representative after the Credentials Committee deferred its decision on rival claims to the seat. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said that the Taliban's desire for international recognition is the only leverage other countries have to press for inclusive government and respect for rights, particularly for women, in Afghanistan. The Taliban's nominated UN envoy Shaheen posted on Twitter last month, we have all the conditions needed for occupying the seat of Afghanistan at UN. We hope legal requirements will supersede political preferences. Myanmar's junta, which seized power from Aung San Suu Kyi's elected government in February, has put forward military veteran Aung Thurain to be its UN envoy. Current Ambassador Kya Mo Tun, appointed by Suu Kyi's government, has also asked to renew his UN accreditation, despite being the target of a plot to kill or injure him over his opposition to the coup. The former UN Special Envoy on Myanmar, who stepped down last month, warned that no country should recognize or legitimize the junta, while Guterres pledged in February to mobilize pressure, to make sure that this coup fails. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said yesterday that travel restrictions imposed over COVID-19 that isolate any one country or region is, not only deeply unfair and punitive, they are ineffective. Speaking to reporters in New York, Guterres said the only way to reduce the risk of transmission while allowing for travel and economic engagement was to repeatedly test travelers, together with other appropriate and truly effective measures. We have the instruments to have safe travel. Let's use those instruments to avoid this kind of, allow me to say, travel apartheid, which I think is unacceptable, Guterres said. Omicron was first identified in Southern Africa and many countries, including the US and Britain have announced travel curbs and other restrictions on the region. Africa has some of the lowest COVID-19 vaccination rates worldwide due to a lack of access to doses. Guterres has long warned about the dangers of vaccine inequality around the world and that low immunization rates are a breeding ground for variants. These travel bans are not justified, said African Union Commission Chair Musa Faki Mahamad at the joint news conference with Guterres after the annual meeting between the United Nations and the African Union. The following is a summary of some recent studies on COVID-19. They include research that warrants further study to corroborate the findings and that has yet to be certified by peer review. Brain problems seen in 1% of hospitalized COVID-19 patients Roughly one in every 100 patients hospitalized with COVID-19 will likely have central nervous system complications, researchers reported on Tuesday at the annual meeting of the Radiological Society of North America. Among nearly 38,000 patients hospitalized with COVID-19 in the U.S. and Europe, symptoms led doctors to suspect brain complications in about 11%. 
Magnetic resonance imaging MRI, and computed tomography CT, exams confirmed central nervous system abnormalities that were most likely associated with the virus in 10% of those patients, for an overall incidence of 1.2%. The most common finding was stroke due to clogged arteries, but the researchers also saw bleeding in the brain, inflammation of the brain, and other potentially fatal complications. Study leader Dr. Scott Farrow of Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia said in a statement that while the lung problems related to COVID-19 are well recognized, our study shows that central nervous system complications represent a significant cause of morbidity and mortality in this devastating pandemic. Moderna vaccine effectiveness not limited to clinical trials Moderna's mRNA COVID-19 vaccine is proving effective in the real world according to doctors at Kaiser Permanente in California who have been tracking nearly 706,000 adults, half of whom had received the vaccine. Five months after the second dose, the vaccine was still 87% effective against SARS-CoV-2 infection, 96% effective against COVID-19 hospitalization, and 98% effective against COVID-19 death, researchers reported in the Lancet Regional Health, Americas. Despite a wide range of chronic diseases among those in the study, the vaccine's effectiveness against infection ranged from 83% to 92% across age, sex, racial, and ethnic subgroups, researchers said. Immunologist E. John Wary of the University of Pennsylvania, who was not involved in the Kaiser study, said it is, highly unlikely, that the Omicron variant of the virus can completely evade all of the immune defenses induced by the vaccines and that current boosters will likely provide increased protection against this variant. COVID-19 at childbirth linked with higher risks. Antibody drugs appear to be safe pregnant women with COVID-19 face higher risks of childbirth complications than those who are not infected by the coronavirus, a new study found. A separate study suggests mildly or moderately ill pregnant women with COVID-19 can safely be treated with monoclonal antibody drugs such as those from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. The analysis of childbirth complications included 244,645 births, 874 of which were in infected women. Researchers reported on Tuesday in PLOS Medicine that miscarriage and stillbirth rates did not differ between the groups. But after accounting for women's risk factors, researchers found that those with COVID-19 had 80% higher odds of having too much amniotic fluid, doubled odds of dangerously high blood pressure, more than doubled odds of amniotic infection, nearly tripled odds of hemorrhage during delivery, and nearly doubled odds of hemorrhage afterward. They were also at higher risk for preterm delivery. Pregnant women and those who plan to conceive are strongly encouraged to be vaccinated, said study leader Dr. Sylvie Eppelboyne of the University of Paris. Meanwhile, doctors at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota treated 51 pregnant patients with mild to moderate COVID-19 with one of several monoclonal antibody treatments. No. Adverse effects were reported, and no patient required COVID-19-related hospitalization, they reported on Sunday on Medrexiv ahead of peer review. So far, 29 of the women have delivered healthy babies. There was one miscarriage due to a congenital defect not related to the medication. The investigators note that while the infusions were well tolerated, the study was a small one. Further research is recommended to fully assess safety and efficacy in pregnancy, they said. The threat of a U.S. federal government shutdown loomed larger yesterday as lawmakers failed to reach a budget agreement with just two days to go before the funding runs out. Congress has until tomorrow night to come up with a new budget in order to avoid a sudden stoppage of most so-called non-essential federal government operations, putting hundreds of thousands of workers on furlough without pay. Various administrative offices, National parks, museums and dozens of other services would see their congressional authorization to spend money stop at the end of tomorrow. During the winter 2018-2019 shutdown, which was the longest in U.S. history at about five weeks, security lines at airports were even affected. Despite deep partisan divisions, the majority of both Republican and Democratic lawmakers hoped to avoid a repeat of that scenario, which could wreak havoc ahead of the holidays. But a handful of Republicans, many of whom are supporters of former President Donald Trump, are refusing to agree to the budget because they say it would contribute to the imposition of vaccine mandates ordered by President Joe Biden. In a statement yesterday, the House Freedom Caucus asked their Senate colleagues to use all procedural tools at your disposal to deny timely passage of any budget agreement that funds vaccine mandates or their enforcement. 
several Democrats expressed their frustration at the partisan stalemate, especially as the first case of the Omicron coronavirus variant was confirmed in the U.S. As we head into winter and brace for the effects of the new Omicron variant, it would be negligent to shut down our government. All in the name of fighting a vaccine requirement designed to boost vaccination rates and save lives, said Senator Mark Warner of Virginia. Congressional budget agreements have often been made at the last minute in recent years, but as concerns grow that lawmakers may miss the deadline, economists have warned of the potential consequences of a looming shutdown. A week of shutdown would cost the U.S. economy some US$6 billion, according to a report by the Oxford Economics Group. Facebook's parent company Meta said yesterday it had derailed an anti-vaccine campaign that harassed medical workers, journalists and elected officials, in a signal of the ongoing pressure from coronavirus pandemic tied misinformation. The social media giant took down accounts in France and Italy that were linked to a conspiracy movement called V underscore V, which inundated pro-vaccine posts with potentially tens of thousands of comments. VV, supporters also, mass harassed, people on YouTube, Twitter, V Contacta and other online platforms, using swastikas or other images as well as calling doctors and media workers, Nazi supporters, for backing vaccines, Meta said. The company's update regarding efforts to counter misinformation and harassment on its platform comes as the tech giant battles accusations that it puts profit over user safety. The firm changed its parent company name to Meta in October as it tries to move past the reputation of Facebook as a scandal-plagued social network to the company's virtual reality vision for the future. A report by social network analysis firm Graphica offered additional information on V underscore V which it says touts itself as engaged in guerrilla, psychological warfare, that targets vaccine supporters. Graphica estimates that, V underscore V, has about 20,000 followers and said the group has been linked to vandalism of hospitals and efforts to disrupt vaccination programs by repeatedly booking and cancelling medical appointments. The group's campaign used messaging service Telegram to train recruits and spread word of who to target, according to Meta Head of Emerging Harms Investigations Mike Viliansky. Using media to spread misinformation, while we aren't banning all V underscore V content, we're continuing to monitor the situation and will take action if we find additional violations, Meta said. Since the start of the pandemic, misinformation has taken many forms, from false and dangerous health advice to so-called miracle cures, conspiracy theories, racist rhetoric and online scams. The U.S. in March denounced what it called a Russian disinformation campaign against U.S.-made COVID-19 vaccines, saying Moscow was putting lives at risk. Meta also reported taking down a sprawling and unsuccessful network out of China that used fake accounts to promote a bogus claim that a Swiss biologist contended the U.S. was putting pressure on World Health Organization scientists to blame China for the pandemic. Investigators on the Meta security team equated the campaign to a hall of mirrors, endlessly reflecting a single fake persona, with even Chinese state media citing the fabricated claim. Clusters of fake accounts attempted post-amplification, which only took root when media picked up the stories, Meta head of security policy Nathaniel Gleischer said in the briefing. But, that was quickly debunked and fizzled out quickly, he added. The tactic reflected a trend of trying to get legitimate news outlets to spread misinformation promoted by networks of fake accounts, Gleischer noted. Operations like these will also target media, marketers and influencers, who need defenses against these kinds of campaigns, he said. Meta found links to employees of people associated with Chinese state infrastructure companies based around the world. This is the first time we have observed an operation that included a coordinated cluster of state employees to amplify itself in this way, Meta said. Our investigation also found that a number of Chinese government officials began interacting with the operation's content less than an hour after it first posted. South Korea's daily coronavirus case numbers rose to a new high today, as authorities halted quarantine exemptions for fully vaccinated inbound travelers for two weeks in a bid to fend off the Omicron variant. The Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency, KDCA, reported 5,266 cases for yesterday, a day after the daily tally rose above 5,000 for the first time amid concerns over a sharp rise in patients with severe symptoms. South Korea will require a 10-day quarantine for all inbound travelers for two weeks starting tomorrow, 
halting exemptions given earlier to fully vaccinated people, the KDCA said. The measure came after South Korea confirmed its first five cases of the Omicron variant late yesterday, including a fully vaccinated couple who arrived last week from Nigeria, followed by two of their family members and a friend. The government is restricting arrivals from eight countries including South Africa, where the variant was first identified. It will now add Nigeria to the list, effective tomorrow, while suspending direct flights from Ethiopia starting Saturday, the KDCA said. We're on a bumpy path toward a phased recovery of normalcy, and risks from the new Omicron variant are rising, President Moon Jae-in told a meeting with Christian groups today. The country has fully inoculated nearly 92% of adults and is now focusing on vaccinating children and a booster program, but experts have warned that cases could continue to rise due in part to the spread of the potentially more transmissible variant. The number of cases has spiked since distancing curbs were relaxed last month, and the government this week shelved plans for further easing due to growing strains on its healthcare system from surging hospitalization and death rates as well as Omicron concerns. KDCA data showed the number of severe cases rose to a record 733, and 90% of intensive care unit beds in the greater Seoul area are occupied, with 915 patients waiting for admission. Total infections rose to 457,612, with 3,705 deaths. Three U.S. states have found cases of the Omicron coronavirus variant, California, Colorado and Minnesota. Among patients who were fully vaccinated and developed mild symptoms, health officials said yesterday. The Minnesota patient is the first known U.S. case of community transmission of the Omicron variant, found in a fully vaccinated man who had recently traveled to New York City and attended a conference. To combat the spread of Omicron, President Joe Biden yesterday announced new testing requirements for international travelers and promised in the coming weeks that Americans would have access to free, rapid-at-home COVID-19 testing. Colorado health officials yesterday said a woman with the Omicron variant had recently returned from a trip to southern Africa. California on Wednesday reported the first U.S. case of the variant in a fully vaccinated traveler who had been in South Africa. The new variant was first detected in southern Africa last month. After determining the Minnesota case had a New York connection, the man attended an anime convention at New York City's Javits Center from November 19 to November 21. Health officials immediately activated the test and trace core, to contact conference attendees in an effort to contain the spread, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio said. We are aware of a case of the Omicron variant identified in Minnesota that is associated with travel to a conference in New York City, and we should assume there is community spread of the variant in our city, the mayor said in a statement. Dr. Lena Wen, a public health professor at George Washington University and former Baltimore Health Commissioner, said it was only a matter of time before more Omicron cases are detected in the U.S. The Minnesota case means that there is spread in the United States. There will be many more cases to come, when said on Twitter. Scientists are investigating Omicron, which has been labeled as a variant of concern by the World Health Organization, to see if it is more transmissible than the Delta variant that is now prevalent and if it causes more severe disease. They are also studying how well current vaccines work against it. Get vaccinated Minnesota Governor Tim Walls said the news of the case in the state was concerning, but it is not a surprise, adding that, we know that this virus is highly infectious and moves quickly throughout the world. Walls urged residents to get vaccinated and wear masks indoors. The best response to the new variant is the same as it's been throughout the pandemic, get a COVID-19 shot, he said. About 60% of the total U.S. population, or 196 million people, have been fully vaccinated, one of the lowest rates among wealthy nations. More than 786,000 people have died from COVID-19 in the U.S., including 37,000 in November alone. Regional authorities in Madrid said yesterday they had detected Spain's first case of the Omicron coronavirus variant in a vaccinated person without links to risk countries, and were investigating two similar suspected cases. It was the fifth confirmed case of the variant in Spain, Health Secretary Silvia Calzon told a news conference later in the day, but the first showing Omicron is already circulating independently in the country. We're already seeing a handful of cases where transmission happened within a household, Calzon said of the 78 confirmed Omicron cases sequenced in the European Union.
but we still don't know the effectiveness of vaccines against this variant. On Wednesday, the northeastern region of Catalonia said it had detected potential traces of the Omicron coronavirus variant in sewage samples from late November. The 62-year-old man in Madrid, who has shown mild symptoms since November 29, is isolating at home while his closest contacts are under quarantine, authorities said. The several other cases being investigated also presented only mild symptoms, and had no history of travel to at-risk countries. Spain plans to begin vaccinating children aged 5 to 11 as soon as possible, with 1.3 million doses of Pfizer's pediatric vaccine due to arrive on December 13, Health Minister Carolina Darias told reporters. A second shipment containing approximately 2 million doses is expected in January, she added. Spain's 14-day coronavirus infection rate rose again yesterday to 234 per 100,000 people, having doubled since November 19 but it remains substantially lower than in some EU countries such as Holland, Belgium or Germany. The health ministry yesterday added 14,500 cases to its tally of COVID-19 infections since the pandemic began. The death toll rose by 42 to 88,122. A group of 67 countries, including the U.S., China and EU members, reached a deal at the World Trade Organization, WTO, yesterday on facilitating trade in services. The countries, which account for just over a third of all WTO members but represent 90% of global trade in services, concluded the accord after four years of negotiations. WTO Chief Ngozi Okonjo Awela hailed the deal as historic pointing to estimates that it would lower the costs associated with the services trade by as much as US$150 billion United States dollars each year. Faced with WTO's longtime failure to conclude multilateral trade deals among all 164 members, smaller numbers of countries have increasingly moved to plurilateral negotiations in a bid to move forward in areas including domestic services regulation. Ads by Kiosk Washington hailed yesterday's deal in a statement, saying it would, improve the transparency and fairness of processes for obtaining authorizations to provide services by professionals and firms in a wide array of fields. This initiative is the first successful WTO services negotiation in years, and shows how WTO members can take practical, common-sense steps to address clearly defined trade problems, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai said in a statement. EU Trade Commissioner Valdis Dombrovskis also hailed the groundbreaking deal tweeting that it would cut red tape in services trade. Trade in services has grown significantly over the past decade and the WTO now estimates that it accounts for around half of world trade. However, trade in services costs are about twice that of trade in goods. A significant portion of the costs is attributable to regulatory differences as well as opaque regulations and burdensome procedures. WTO members are free to regulate their service sectors, but starting in 2017, the growing group of countries has worked towards developing good regulatory practices so as not to restrict trade unnecessarily. Washington joined the group in July. The US, Canada and European allies expanded sanctions on Belarus yesterday, placing restrictions on government figures and entities for human rights abuses and official support for migrant smuggling. The sanctions targeted senior security and justice officials, prominent media figures, a son of Belarus strongman Alexander Lukashenko, defense-related firms and a major fertilizer exporter. The U.S. Treasury also restricted the trading of some Belarus sovereign debt by U.S. entities. The sanctions were in response to continuing attacks on human rights and fundamental freedoms in Belarus, disregard for international norms and repeated acts of repression, said a joint statement from the U.S., Britain, Canada and the European Union. The statement demanded Lukashenko's regime, immediately and completely halt its orchestrating of irregular migration across its borders with the EU. We call for the regime to unconditionally and without delay release its almost 900 political prisoners, and end its campaign of repression, it said. Washington said its sanctions target, migrant smuggling and victimization of migrants. Today's actions demonstrate our unwavering determination to act in the face of a brutal regime that increasingly represses Belarusians, undermines the peace and security of Europe, and continues to abuse people seeking only to live in freedom, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said in a statement. 
France formally rejected the idea of joint patrols with British security forces on its Channel coast in a letter seen by AFP yesterday from French Prime Minister Jean Castex to his British counterpart Boris Johnson. Castex wrote that, We cannot accept that British police or soldiers patrol on our coasts. It's a question of sovereignty and I know your government's sensitivity towards respecting the sovereignty of others. Johnson wrote a letter to French President Emmanuel Macron last week proposing joint patrols as well as the systematic return of migrants arriving in England from France after crossing the Channel. His decision to make it public caused fury in Paris where Macron condemned his approach as, not serious. Sending migrants back to us is not an option and is not a serious or responsible way of tackling the issue, a source in the Prime Minister's office said yesterday. The French letter, sent on Wednesday evening to Johnson and shared with journalists yesterday, began by saying that, every country must face up to its responsibilities. It said France had deployed 700 police officers to patrol the coast, while 41 people smuggling rings had been broken up since the start of the year. It added that, managing the presence of migrants that want to go to your country falls firstly on France, which is not normal. In fact, a large part of the solution is not to be found in France, but in the UK, Castex wrote. He urged Britain to adopt a more efficient returns policy to deport failed asylum seekers, as well as opening up legal migration routes for those who have legitimate reasons to want to come to your country. Only you can ensure that your labor market is sufficiently controlled to discourage people wanting to work illegally, he wrote. It also warned Britain against pushing back migrant boats, an option that has been under discussion by the government in London, saying this would endanger the lives of migrants and would break maritime law. Franco-British relations have dived again since the deaths of at least 27 migrants in a boat attempting to cross the channel from France to England on November 24. The U.S. and Iran both sounded pessimistic yesterday about the chances of reviving the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, with Washington saying it had little cause for optimism and Tehran questioning the determination of U.S. and European negotiators. I have to tell you, recent moves, recent rhetoric, don't give us a lot of cause for optimism, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told reporters in Stockholm, saying he could judge in a day or so if Iran would engage in good faith. Blinken made the comments after Iran provided the European powers who are shuttling between U.S. and Iranian officials in Vienna with drafts on sanctions removal and nuclear commitments, as world powers and Tehran seek to reinstate the tattered pact. We went to Vienna with serious determination, but we are not optimistic about the will and the intention of the U.S. and the three European parties to the deal, Iranian Foreign Minister Hossein Amirabdallahian was quoted by Iranian media as saying in a conversation with his Japanese counterpart. While Blinken said, it is not too late for Iran to reverse course and engage meaningfully, it appeared as if both sides might be seeking to avoid the blame if the talks break down. The comments came on the fourth day of indirect U.S.-Iran talks on bringing both nations back into the deal, under which Iran limited its nuclear program in return for relief from U.S., European Union and uneconomic sanctions. Talks resumed on Monday after a five-month hiatus prompted by Iran's election of an anti-Western hardliner as president. Sources familiar with the matter saw Eid Iran and the remaining parties to the deal, Britain, China, France, Germany and Russia, might hold a formal meeting today, a step that could mark the end of this week's negotiations. The blame game has been ongoing, and is going to continue, said Eurasia Group analyst Henry Rome adding that even if the talks pause this week all sides have an interest in keeping the conversation going for now and there may be another round later this year or early next. Part of it is blame game, part of it is really wanting, at least from the western side, to be sure to exhaust all options, Rome said. Keeping the talks going may also help Iran in, prolonging the period before I think there will very likely be a shift toward a more coercive western position, and also provide some cover to advance their nuclear program, he added. The UN nuclear watchdog said on Wednesday that Iran has started producing enriched uranium with advanced centrifuges at its Fordo plant dug into a mountain, further eroding the nuclear deal. It was unclear whether Blinken had been briefed on Iran's latest proposals when he made his pessimistic comments. Iran's chief nuclear negotiator Ali Bagheri Khani Saeed Iran had delivered two drafts to the Europeans, one on sanctions removal and the other on nuclear limitations. We want all sanctions to be lifted at once, Bagheri told reporters in Vienna, 
outlining a position unlikely to be warmly welcomed by the West, which has sought some kind of sequence under which Iran would return to the pact's nuclear limits. Under the pact, Tehran limited its uranium enrichment program, a potential pathway to nuclear weapons though Iran says it seeks only civilian atomic energy, in exchange for relief from the economic sanctions. But in 2018, then-U.S. President Donald Trump abandoned the deal, calling it too soft on Iran, and reimposed harsh U.S. sanctions, spurring Tehran to breach nuclear limits in the pact. New York police yesterday arrested a man holding a shotgun outside the United Nations headquarters after a tense standoff in which roads around the venue were cordoned off. According to a UN official speaking on condition of anonymity, the man had threatened to kill himself in front of one of the building's main entrances. Images showed armed police surrounding him as he walked up and down the sidewalk holding the gun for more than two hours. We have one male in custody in regard to this incident, a NYPD spokesman said. The United Nations had earlier told staff that the area was secured by police and that no UN staff or associates are in danger. UN meetings were not interrupted as police negotiated with the man before his arrest. U.S. President Joe Biden announced yesterday a winter campaign against COVID-19, with new testing requirements for travelers and a surge in vaccination efforts. Biden has brought steady leadership after the chaotic Donald Trump years, but the mutating coronavirus continues to defy him, helping drive his approval ratings deep underwater. Urging the nation, in particular his political rivals, to unite behind the strategy, Biden unveiled a raft of actions designed to tamp down COVID-19 in the coming months, as the latest Omicron variant spreads worldwide. Eight cases of the new strain have so far been confirmed in the U.S., including five in New York announced yesterday evening by State Governor Kathy Hochul. One case involves a Minnesota man with no recent international travel history who had recently returned from New York City, signaling the strain is already circulating inside the country. It's a plan that I think should unite us, Biden said, speaking from the headquarters of the National Institutes of Health in a Washington suburb. I know COVID-19 has been very divisive. In this country, it's become a political issue, a sad, sad commentary. It shouldn't be, but it has been. The actions include the requirement that all inbound international travelers be tested within one day of flying. This will apply to all travelers, both U.S. and foreign, regardless of vaccination status, the official said. For domestic travelers, Biden will announce he is extending a mask mandate on airplanes, trains and other public transport through mid-March. White House spokeswoman Jen Psaki told reporters testing and vaccine requirements could eventually be added to domestic flights too. Nothing is off the table, she said. The barrage of measures is partly meant to reassure Americans that Biden is doing everything possible to prevent the pandemic from derailing the impressive U.S. economic recovery and the winter holidays. Biden and his aides have repeatedly stressed in recent days that there will be no return to mass shutdowns. But the White House also faces the challenge that many Americans are not receptive to Biden's appeals for collective action. Despite ever more creative attempts to encourage people to get their shots, about 40 percent of the country has yet to be fully vaccinated. About 110 million people who are eligible to get booster shots have still not taken the opportunity. Officials said a surge in outreach on vaccines and booster shots will be launched, with a nationwide campaign targeting recipients of Medicare public health care. The government will team up with AARP, a large lobbying group representing people aged 50 and over. At the other end of the age scale, the Biden administration will try to ensure that schools do not return to mass lockdowns. We're expanding our efforts to vaccinate children, ages 5 and up, said Biden. For any parent worried about the Omicron variant or the Delta variant, get your child vaccinated at one of the 35,000 locations in the country. In another bolstering of existing policies, the White House will encourage the use of home testing kits by announcing that health insurance must cover 100% of the cost. For those without health insurance, there will be an increase in the availability of free kits. The kits currently sell for around US$25, as opposed to being available either for free or at nominal costs among peer nations in Europe. Meanwhile, the White House stressed that the administration's restrictions on travelers from eight Southern African countries over growing Omicron fears was not a punishment to those nations but a safety measure.
We of course are in close touch at a diplomatic level with leaders in these countries about the steps we're taking, Pasaki said, referring to the ban imposed last week on U.S. arrivals from Botswana, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Lesotho, Swaziland, Mozambique, Malawi and South Africa. It's not meant to be a punishment, she added. It is steps recommended by our public health officials and medical experts in order to delay the spread of a variant. The state of New York has confirmed five cases of the coronavirus Omicron variant, Governor Kathy Hochul said yesterday, bringing the total number of U.S. detections of the new strain to eight. New York state has confirmed five cases of the Omicron variant, Hochul said in a Twitter post aimed at reassuring residents of the nation's fourth most populous state that the detections were not unexpected. Let me be clear. This is not cause for alarm. We knew this variant was coming and we have the tools to stop the spread, she said. Get your vaccine. Get your booster. Wear your mask. It was not immediately clear whether the new cases were in or near New York City, the country's most populous metropolitan area and whether they were detected in people who had recently returned from traveling outside the country. Eight cases have so far been confirmed in the U.S., with at least one, in Minnesota, involving a person with no recent international travel history, signaling the strain is already circulating inside the country. Hochul's figures followed the announcement by President Joe Biden that he is bolstering his administration's campaign against COVID-19 as the winter takes hold. The new measures include requiring all inbound international travelers be tested within one day of flying, and an extension of mask mandates on public transportation through mid-March. The U.S. House of Representatives voted yesterday to keep federal agencies running for another 11 weeks and avoid a costly holiday season government shutdown, although the stopgap measure faces a thorny path in the Senate. With the cash due to dry up after 11.59 p.m. today, the Democratic-controlled lower chamber passed temporary legislation to keep the lights on until February 18. The continuing resolution would avoid millions of public workers being sent home unpaid with Christmas approaching, as parks, museums and other federal properties and services closed. But a small group of hardline Republicans is threatening to slow down the measure in the Senate in protest over the White House's pandemic response, meaning the closure remains a very real possibility. They say they won't back down unless Democrats agree to a straight majority vote on defunding President Joe Biden's vaccine or testing mandate for large companies. The right-wing Republican group, which may amount to as little as two or three senators, argues that the mandate is an assault on personal liberty. Only a single House Republican, anti-Trump Congressman Adam Kinzinger, voted for yesterday's stopgap, which passed by 221 votes to 212. In theory the measure would buy legislators time to negotiate full-year spending bills for the rest of fiscal 2022. But it would need the support of every Republican in the 50-50 Senate to bypass the normal, days-long procedure needed to advance to the floor and be rubber-stamped in time to avoid a weekend shutdown. The pandemic has killed more than 780,000 people in the U.S. and the troubling new Omicron variant of the coronavirus has raised fears of a winter surge in cases. But legal challenges have mounted against Biden's edict requiring vaccination or weekly tests for some sections of the U.S. workforce, including companies with more than 100 employees. Republican Senator Mike Lee wants to remove federal funding to implement the mandate and is backed by right-wingers in both chambers. If the choice is between temporarily suspending non-essential functions on the one hand and, on the other hand, standing idle as up to 45 million Americans lose their jobs, their livelihoods and their ability to work, I'll stand with American workers every time, he said. The figure Lee cited would represent more than a quarter of the 157 million people that make up the U.S. workforce, according to the Pew Research Center. Only 5% of unvaccinated adults say they have left a job due to a vaccine mandate, according to an October survey by the Kaiser Family Foundation. The majority of Republicans, including the party's Senate leader Mitch McConnell, are against the move, fearing they will be blamed for a shutdown. But in the evenly divided upper chamber, any single senator can torpedo any vote. Ahead of the House vote McConnell said Republicans would support the continuing resolution. But there was no clear signal that he had brokered a deal to bring Lee and the other holdouts to heel. Speaker Nancy Pelosi, the most senior Democrat in the House, hit out at Lee and his backers, accusing them of defiance of science and public health.
If Congress fails to keep the government open, the closures would begin just after midnight tomorrow and could bleed into the following week. There has never been a shutdown during a national emergency such as the pandemic, but the Congressional Budget Office estimates that the 2018-19 stoppage wiped 11 billion United States dollars from the economy. With the threat of the shutdown off the table, Democratic leadership would be free to focus on passing Biden's domestic agenda, a US$1.8 trillion United States dollars social welfare and climate spending plan. The bill is central to Biden's legacy, but risks failing because of feuding between the Democrats' progressive and centrist factions. Lawmakers are also deadlocked over the prospect of a first-ever U.S. debt default that would erase an estimated 6 million jobs and wipe out US$15 trillion United States dollars of household wealth, tanking the economy. The government is likely to run out of cash on or soon after December 15, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has warned, unless Congress raises the federal borrowing cap. But Republicans say they won't help, despite having pressed for hikes under former President Donald Trump, because they want no part in the Democrats' historically large package of social reforms. COVID-19 vaccines made by Pfizer and Moderna that use mRNA technology provide the biggest boost to antibody levels when given 10 to 12 weeks after the second dose, a British study published yesterday has found. The COV boost study was cited by British officials when they announced that Pfizer and Moderna were preferred for use in the country's booster campaign, but the data has only been made publicly available now. The study found that six out of the seven boosters examined enhanced immunity after initial vaccination with Pfizer-BioNTech's vaccine, while all seven increased immunity when given after two doses of AstraZeneca's vaccine. A third dose will be effective for many of the vaccines we've tested and in many different combinations, Professor Saul Faust, an immunologist at the University of Southampton and the trial's lead, told reporters. The study found that a full dose or half dose of Pfizer or a full dose of Moderna gave a very effective boost to both antibody and T-cell levels, regardless of whether the person initially received Pfizer or AstraZeneca. When AstraZeneca, Novavax, Johnson & Johnson and CureVac were given as boosters, they increased antibody levels for either initial vaccine, albeit to a smaller degree. However, while Valnova boosted antibodies in people initially vaccinated with AstraZeneca, it did not provide a boost for Pfizer. The study found that booster shots also helped to generate a broad T-cell response against the beta and delta variants, which may play a key role in longer-term protection. T-cell response does seem to be broader against all the variant strains, which gives us hope that a variant strain of the virus might be able to be handled, certainly hospitalization and death, if not prevention of infection, by the current vaccines, Faust said. The study pre-dated the spread of the Omicron variant of concern, but Faust said he had shared samples with the UK Health Security Agency to generate data on Omicron as well. Omicron is a variant of COVID-19 first sequenced in South Africa with cases now present in over 20 countries and on all continents. It was named only a week ago and it will take time to understand its impact on the pandemic. Here is a summary of what we know and what questions surround the new version of the virus. We don't know. South African epidemiologist Salim Abdul Karim says it was detected first in Botswana and then in South Africa where the announcement of the new variant was made on November 25. On Tuesday, Dutch authorities announced that six days before that on November 19 an individual had tested positive for what also turned out to be the Omicron variant. However, the World Health Organization, WHO, said, the first known laboratory-confirmed case was identified from a specimen collected on November 9, 2021, without specifying where. It has probably been circulating in South Africa for longer than we thought. Since early October, Jean-Francois Delfrecy, president of the French government's scientific advisory board told AFP. The day after South Africa's announcement, WHO named the new variant after a Greek letter like previous versions, and classified it a variant, of concern. The classification is based on Omicron's genetic characteristics and also how it seems to have behaved in the population so far. Omicron's unique genetic structure translates to multiple changes to the spike protein that might make it more contagious and harder to control via current vaccines, but these possibilities are so far theoretical. Meanwhile, cases in the Gauteng province of South Africa, which includes Johannesburg, have gone up rapidly with many identified as Omicron. 
Researchers across the world are looking into how contagious Omicron is, the severity of disease it causes, and whether it is more resistant to vaccines. WHO has said the process will likely take weeks. The Delta variant is currently the form of COVID that is the most sequenced across the globe. Naturally competing variants that evolved after Delta, like lesser-known Mu and Lambda, have not managed to overtake it in the population, but the spread of Omicron in gouting suggests it could. Yesterday, the European Centre for Disease Control ECDC said that if the pattern in South Africa is reproduced in Europe, Omicron could make up the majority of COVID cases within a few months. However, Delta was never very present in South Africa, so a comparison with Europe is hard to draw at this stage. Writing in British Daily The Guardian, US expert Eric Topol said it is not clear whether Omicron's spread is because of high transmission, like Delta, or immune evasion. Immune evasion is when a virus can infect a person who has already gained immunity either from previous infection or from vaccination. On Sunday, a South African doctor said she had treated about 30 cases of Omicron and had only encountered mild symptoms in these patients. The scientific community warned against drawing conclusions based on this testimony since the patients were mostly young and therefore less at risk of serious COVID. So far, all cases detected in Europe are either asymptomatic or with mild symptoms, according to the EDCD. This does not mean that Omicron will not cause serious COVID, but it does leave the door open to a rare optimistic hypothesis. If Omicron is very contagious but doesn't cause severe COVID and doesn't fill hospital beds, it could confer group immunity and contribute to making SARS-CoV-2 into a benign seasonal virus, which would help end the crisis, French virologist Bruno Canard tweeted. He added, however, that such a scenario would be a stroke of luck. Again, it is too early to say whether vaccines will be less effective against transmission or severe disease from Omicron than against other variants. We have to see whether the antibodies produced by current vaccines still work and to what extent, whether they still prevent severe illness, said Enif. While waiting for real-world data, scientists are trying to answer this question through lab tests. But even if vaccines are less effective against Omicron it doesn't mean they will be totally ineffective. In addition to the antibody response that could be weakened by mutations in Omicron, the body has secondary T-cell responses that can protect against severe illness. We think that the cell response will be partly effective against Omicron, said Delphrey C.